We can't lose you, Dr. Lepre. Okay. Good evening, everybody. It's so great that we're going to have you here. This is a long meeting, so we'll be here for about three and a half hours. Just settle in. I'm just kidding. Um, it's really wonderful to see you all here tonight. Um, this is by far one of, I think, the committee's um, most proud and favorite nights um, when we get a chance to recognize our students. So I'd like to call to order the school committee meeting of Tuesday, November 7th. May I please have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. Are there any comments from the public this evening before we get into the items on the agenda? Okay. Seeing none, Dr. Bucky, would you please come up and present the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship Class of 2018 recipients? I think it's wonderful so many people are involved in the civil process and came out for the school board meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it wasn't too long ago when uh, this recognition was for about a dozen to 15 students in the senior class, but as our enrollment has grown, um, so has our opportunity to recognize more students. Um, the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship provides for up to eight semesters of tuition free at a state college or university in the Commonwealth. And up through the class of 2016, it was based on their ELA and MCAS score, or ELA and Mathematics MCAS score. Beginning with the class of 2016, it needed to be ELA, Mathematics, and Science. And to qualify for the award, they have to score advanced on one of the MCAS and proficient in the other two. And then on the basis of those three scores, be within the top 25% of their class. So tonight, it's my great pleasure to recognize 35 oh my goodness. seniors in the graduating class of 2008. So as we have done traditionally, I'm going to read through the list of names when a student hears their name, if they would line up on this railing behind me. The railing used to fit all of them. I don't think 35 is going to, mm -hmm. so we'll just snake around. And then we'll ask each student to uh, introduce themselves individually to the committee and talk about their plans for next year, knowing that some of them are not at all clear what that plan <laughs> might be, looking for a gap year, looking to do service, or maybe continue their education. But um, this scholarship is good for eight semesters and they can defer if they want to Fantastic. up to six years Fantastic. Fantastic. Six years. Yep. Wow. <laughs> Great. your parents just have my, my heart attack please don't defer for six years <laughs> so as i read your name if you will come down and stand and then we'll go through the list lucy Bursette, liam canole Sarah Dami, and this is also my first opportunity to mispronounce a student's name before graduation so that I get many shots that in that final opportunity awesome. before the diploma <laughs> that I get it correct. Diego Echeverria, Jared Funderburg, Natalie Gammons, Tierney Goddard, Janae Hastings, Claudia Hofford, Tristan Humphreys, Marielle Jellamy, Ioana Kalpasanova, Emily Kitsak, Ben Lombardi, Nick Mizzarelli, Amelia Murphy, Karen Murtaugh, John Parsons, Emma Pierce, Catherine Pittman, Caroline Richards, Emma Ricard, Christiana Ragavine, Carter Snell, Abigail Tate, Samantha Trattel, Jonathan Tresher, Maggie Visco, Vonna Walker, Dina Ray Weatherly, Owen West, Tessa Weldon, Isaiah Williams, Christina Wilson, and Aurora Zumicki. <laughs> the 35 students. And if you just introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your projected plans for next year, and I think we'll try and like you. Okay. Um, well, I'm Lucy. Definitely going to college next year. 
don't really have a top choice, but I'm excited. That's what it. would you like to test? <laughs> oh, um, something either genetics or literature. Thank you. Um, I'm Sarah. Uh, I'm definitely going to college next year. I want to study business. Do you have a top choice? Uh, Boston University. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I'm Diego. Uh, I'm going to college next year, and I want to study architecture, uh, preferably at UMass Amherst. The waiver will help <laughs> Um, my name is Natalie Gammons. I do plan to go to college next year. I don't have a top choice at the moment, but I want to study nursing. My name is Tierney Goddard. I plan on going to college next year. I'm not sure where yet. Um, and I'm interested in interior design. I'm Janae Hastings. Um, I plan on going to college next year. I don't have a top choice yet, but I'm looking to study psychology. My name is Tristan Humphreys, and uh, I'm planning to go to college. My top choice is UMass Amherst, and I want to study computer science. My name is Marielle Jellamy. I don't have a top choice, but I would like to study art therapy. Um, hi, my name is Ioana Kalpazanova. Um, I'm definitely planning on going to college next year. Um, my top choice right now is Vanderbilt, and I'm doing early decision there and I'm planning on majoring in medical studies. Um, my name is Emily Kitzok and I'm definitely going to college next year. My top choice is Northeastern University and I want to study either chemistry or biology for a pre-med track. <laughs> Hi, my name is Amelia Murphy. I am planning on going to college next year. My top choice currently is Georgetown <laughs> University and I am planning on studying politics or anthropology with an international focus. I'm Jack Parsons. I plan on going to college next year and my top choice is Rochester Institute of Tech and I'm looking to study imaging sciences. My name is Emma Pierce. I'm planning on going to college next year and I would like to study international business at the Honors College at College of Charleston. Um, I'm Katherine Pittman. I'm planning on going to college next year, and I'm interested in engineering. Hello, I'm Caroline Richards. I'm also planning on going to college next year. My top choice is University of Southern California, and I'm planning on studying journalism. <laughs> My name is Christiana Raghavin. I also plan on going to college next year. I don't have a top choice, but I plan on studying biology. <laughs> Um, my name is Samantha Tertel, and I'm going to college next year. Um, I don't have a top choice, but I'm going to be pursuing in um, marine sciences. Hi, my name is Vonna Walker. I don't have a top choice right now, but I plan on studying biology. Hi, my name is Dina Weatherly, and I would like to study international relations with a focus in political science at Wellesley College. Um, my name is Isaiah Williams. My top choice is the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, and I plan on studying organ or something not music related. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Nina Wilson, and I am planning on going to college next year, preferably at Boston University, and I'm interested in studying biochemistry and molecular biology. Hi, my name is Aurora Zemicki. My top college is Long Island University's Global College, um, and they only have one degree, which is Global Studies. So. <laughs> An impressive group of that. Yeah. <laughs> and if, if I may, there are um, several students who are soccer players who aren't here, and they won their playoff game today 3-1. to one. Miss anybody? Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, parents, for, for coming out tonight. This is a wonderful um, opportunity and many of firsts for our senior class in recognizing their accomplishments. And um, please decide to stay if you're really curious about school improvement plans and English language updates, but we Boy, won't. That sends them wrong. I know. <laughs> and see you bye. <laughs> Thanks again. Okay. 
we'll give everyone a minute to exit the room and then perhaps I will start with Ms. Kubish for the school improvement plans. You know, I think we're going to need you to get close to a microphone. Um, so you know what I'm going to do is bring a chair. Then come up to the hole of death up there. Can everyone sco can you scoot a chair around and I'll scoot another, just scoot a chair, Arizona, an empty chair, and oh, I'll sure. grab another one. Down. Nope, I'm going to bring it just this chair over. Hi, Zona. Hi. Hi. Do you see where Sorry. I'm going? No, that? I didn't. Sorry. It's okay, just bring that chair around. Natalie, Zona, skip one over. Doesn't really matter. Now we have an extra got it. One. Musical chairs. I think I got it. Now. Yeah, there Everybody we go. Everybody find a seat. Here. Yeah. No. Okay. I guess. And let's. Yeah. This. Maybe a little of this. Something like that. And Mike and I can share. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Okay. This is so yeah, thank 30. you. Yes. Wow. Thirty-five. Amazing. So, Ms. Kubish is here to um, work, walk us through the school improvement plan for the Nantucket Elementary School. Take it away. Thank you. Um, so, I believe you all have a paper copy of this, and that's all that I brought with me. Um, so, we, I call your attention on page two to our much smaller school council, <laughs> because we're a much smaller school now. Um, so we do have two uh, parents, one has been on for a bit, and two brand new teachers to join brand new to school council. They had not done school council before. So we take our school council every year takes our old improvement plan, new information that we have, and we try to tweak it. So rather than go page by page by page, I'll just highlight some of the new things. So in goal one, we're focusing on improving academic achievement for all students, and initially we're, we're doing some piloting and reviewing of new programs. We're using Eureka in math and uh, Fontes and Pinnell Classroom, which we had professional development on today that was exceptional. Mm. So that was terrific. We are looking at different literacy resources, and that's been a conversation we've been having with Jean Witt as well. So that was a new one. In the third block down, we're doing that targeted skill support, and we do it in whole group, small group, and then stations. And through some data that we've been reviewing, we're certainly seeing that we need to focus on responding to text, explaining their thinking, and using language, and that could be conventions. On page four, we have a standards-based report card. Uh, certainly the middle school has spent some time working on theirs, tweaking theirs. Ours has not been revamped in the seven years I've been here. Uh, what we do every trimester is we report on different standards. And the team agrees on the different standards they're reporting on based on the pacing maps they've created. So we are convening a committee in our building to um, really take a look at the whole thing maintain standards based that's really important to us one of the things and i believe nis is talking about this as well we report four three two one we are thinking about taking the four out because the the focus in every grade level should be mastering that standard so we're looking at potentially taking the four out um, we know that we have some kindergarten teachers who really want to make sure that we're still addressing developmental ages and stages. So um, we think that that'll be a wonderful committee to really spend the year taking a look at other districts, other report cards, and really seeing what will work best for us here. Uh, we always have our team meetings that occur weekly, and that's where we're spending a lot of time really making sure that teachers are calibrating the way they evaluate student work. Uh, underneath that, um, Donna Johnson and Becky Hickman did this in a presentation about their trip to Teachers College, mm -hmm. and they talked about stamina. So we have added that as a building-wide goal, and we have it set for every grade level. We have thermometers hanging outside classrooms, but we're really trying to build that foundation for our students so that they know how to be self-sustained in an activity. Uh, and that would be independent reading and writing. So we are working on that. 
Uh, and we think that that will be really important as kids move through to the testing years where they will need to have that stamina to write their essays and uh, read text over long periods of time. In order to do that, and it's something that we're seeing reflected statewide, I believe, um, with moving to testing online, we have um, certainly done some testing work inside of our technology teaching that was happening every other week up until this year. Um, and certainly our previous media specialists worked on park-like questions and MCAS-like questions. But one of the things that little ones don't know how to do is type. So we can teach them about drag and drop, but we're also looking at developmentally appropriate typing programs to help our little kids understand how to use those keys. So that's new. Then we move to um, really supporting differentiated instruction for all of our students. And uh, on page five, in the primary school, we, we have pacing maps, but you can't really create a unit of study on the foundations of reading because it varies depending on who our student is. So we are doing some, we have pacing maps for content areas and some areas like writing, we have created units of study, but they um, are always things that we continue to look at and tweak as we go forward. The other two blocks on page five essentially stay the same. That is how you review data in the bottom uh, block is to take a look at it, determine our areas of strength and weakness, make a plan for how to fix our areas of weakness, and then execute our strategies and interventions, and then how did we do? So we just keep that cycle going. On to page six. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, can I ask a quick question? Sure. On, on that? Um, how do you, um, how do you measure that in NES now that you don't have third graders? How do we measure our yeah. assessment data? Yeah. So we have, and you'll see it, it's maybe I didn't mention it and we went past it, but we do um, assessments that are our summative. So mm -hmm. we do an Ames Web test on reading and math, mm -hmm. and we do that three times a year. Okay. We do Fontes and Pinnell benchmarks, which is really a reading assessment, a comprehensive reading assessment. And um, we do that three times a year as well. Okay. And then we have math unit tests that mm -hmm. we're using Eureka, so that's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, they have a lot of formative assessments built into Eureka, so you're checking that progress much more with much more regularity and frequency. Okay. But those are the assessments that we typically okay. use. But you would look at, for example, mm -hmm grade three now at NIS's results and see where those patterns are and adjust your curriculum yes. and teaching uh, based yes, on those I results. I think that will come up. Okay. Um, yes. So if we move to page six, and I believe that's where it is. So we have just been doing, um, we just began our assessment review with MCAS and we are looking at third, fourth, and <coughs> fifth grade. Um, we know that now we're in a position that we have to build this foundation and really send kids to NIS that are equipped to do this work. So that's why we're doing a little typing introduction. That's why we're doing um, this assessment data. What you did initially was handed out some information in regards to MCAS. We did some pulling of the item analysis. We did some whole grade level performance. We did, and what we did is we, divided up into vertical groups in our building that included uh, specialist art music, PE, TAs, uh, a grade level teacher, pre-KK, one and two. And we started to look and say, what are we noticing? And that's our initial, that's, that was our initial work. We're still drilling down further now to get to that item analysis so that we can say things like, I said before, overall there were some language usage problems. Those were the conventions and mechanics in writing. So what do we need to do better to make sure our kids know those tools? So we're certainly doing that and it's really going to be ongoing work, but we hope to have that really um, identified and honed in on by December so that we can set up a plan for each grade level to do that work and build upon the previous grade level. The next one in here, which is new for us, and it's really been terrific, is Michelle Brady comes once a month 
and does a staff meeting and Kelly Cooney d comes once a month and does a staff meeting and they keep a special ed focus once a month and an ELL focus once a month and they're sharing information about our kids about mm -hmm. processes that they that we can use about um, uh, sometimes we talk about different skills you can use we look at data for, for both of those subgroups and it's really been super helpful to our staff that's the feedback I've been getting is wow that was great I didn't really understand the continuum for mm -hmm. special ed I didn't really understand all the different SEI things that I could potentially be using or doing or other things that I have done or not done. Um, that's the end of page six, really, because the others are the same. They involve certainly the evaluation process. And then we have the positive climate and um, safe and secure schools. So lots of things stay in place. Responsive classroom. We are a responsive classroom school. The bullying stays the same. We have the visitor sign-in process. We're doing the uh, facility walkthroughs once a month to go through all of those safety items. But then some other things that we've uh, begun to do is to hold a whole school morning meeting, which um, there have probably been two times every year that we put the whole school in the gym prior to this year. It's tight. So this year we had our first one. We'll do them at the end of every month where we follow the morning meeting process, but the whole school is involved. And each grade level will be um, helping us run those. And it'll be a focus on um, different things that they're doing in their classroom, like the second grade will lead the share for the whole group or the greetings. So that's really helping us to build that community. Um, we are working on boosting morale through quarterly gathering shout outs. We have this little group that is called NES Express. And so what that's doing is really teaching, I read an article recently about it being one of the top three hardest jobs or professions. And um, just in our professional development today, the amount of planning that teachers really need to do to be effective teachers is significant. And so we're just doing little things like um, a little pot of flowers on your birthday. We had candy corns that kids or the teachers could count and win an Amazon gift card. So we're just doing little things every day. We have a what are we thankful for bulletin board up in the hallway right now. We also have each grade level is changing the bulletin boards monthly to highlight something in their grade level. So we're just doing feel good things to really get through some of those hard, tough days. So I think that's page seven. Um, page eight, we have not changed much. Our communication changes a little bit. So we used to do this um, 10 page newsletter monthly and then found that classroom teachers were sending those uh, newsletters home. So rather than be duplicitous, duplicitous we're doing uh, quarter, quarterly newsletters that come from me, but the teachers are sending things home weekly. We do our PACE messages, we do ESPN emails, we, um, I use the Blackboard Connect often. Um, then we're doing focused copies. We still have NHA. We don't have the um, sleepover anymore because we have what we call the littles. But we have Evan who comes from the NHA to do museum in my school and he connects that to social study standards but also teaches uh, island history and those uh, lessons for every grade level. Second to last are those community things that have been important to us. We had an Aspen night, which I believe I've mentioned before. It was initially, it was like the second week of school and we invited um, people to come in and learn about Aspen and Joanne Johnson ran that for us and Patricia Harding was there to do some translation and we had 50 people in attendance, so it was really good. We have already had our math night our literacy night is planned. We hope to have an ELL night. Um, every year in May, we do our big lip sync that the whole community gets involved in. And this year, we're going to try a color run with the kids, too. Oh, how fun. <laughs> um, and then the last thing on page eight is um, we have some computers, like one or two, set up in places that when parents come in, because they're still coming in a lot 
in the elementary school, we are trying to help facilitate them getting on the computer right there and doing some of that re registration work. Certainly in the beginning of September, we were doing that. But um, both Jane Melville and Patricia Harding have been um, pivotal in really pulling a parent aside, like, come, come sit down with me and I'll walk you through how to do that. So we hope that that'll be helpful to everybody going up, that we have um, really tried to build that foundation for Aspen. And then on the last page, uh, we have talked about creating a different opening day packet for our families. We send a very similar packet home on um, in August that announces who your teacher is and we give some basic information. This year, we seem to have a lot of children coming from uh, private schools, whether it was new or lighthouse or children's house, and they didn't come for kindergarten, but they came for first. And you sort of take for granted what we have told kindergartners about the start of our day and how you send letters or how you call when people are sick. So we're gonna do like a, the school council, we're gonna work on this with teachers and administration to tweak that so that we have a better mailing to send home to people, especially our brand new families who don't know how to navigate all those things. And then the final one is about professional development, which is also integrated throughout, but um, most of those things are still in place this year. Any questions from Kim? <coughs> um, yeah. Thank you, Kim, for this You're um, welcome. outline of your um, school improvement. I love that you're doing school assemblies um, once a month, I think, bringing the community together in a school. I know that um, it's been successful at the high school, and I, I know for students and teachers have enjoyed that, but I think bringing the whole school together occasionally is, is lovely. Um, I know it's where we are right now, but just it, and having just come from a meeting around um, developing and helping our children grow into the careers and trades that they'll be going into after they graduate, I wonder, um, and, I, and I know we'll have some of these conversations at our strategic plan, but I hope that we can move into, in our plans and for future, is talking about particularly in the young schools, the importance of play and where that comes into how we implement and allow time for play, creativity and critical thinking. Mm -hmm. So I know that we are struck and held heavy um, by, the, by our test scores, and that makes me sad, to be honest. Um, and to think that we're teaching um, second graders how to use a keyboard in order to take a test I think is a sign of our times of where we are but I think we should all really sit and think about that for a minute and think about what we are doing to our young children if we're implementing keyboard training to, and, and not this is not a judgment on our school it's the, it's the reality of where we are so I hope that in our strategic plan we can have some rich dialogue on how we can implement more creativity critical thinking collaboration across our schools because um, otherwise I think we'll be doing, you know, not our best for our kids. There's, there are a multitude of typing programs out there. It's not like my high school typing program yeah. where I wasn't allowed to see any letters or do any of that. Yeah. There, um, in, at the kindergarten level, it's called Keyboard Zoo. So it's about connecting things that they already have, play things to the different actions you would do on a computer. Right. The other reality for all of us um, as a parent, as a aunt, and I have a two-year-old nephew who can navigate an iPad like nobody's business. And those are some of the things that he knows how to do on that. So Peter has talked about this at length. It's, it's teaching those things for a purpose and why we want to do those things. And, and we are not saying because you have to do this on the test. Oh, no, no, I don't imagine yeah. that you it's are. It's developed. The, the programs that we will be using are different for each grade level, and they are developmentally appropriate. Yeah. I hear you, though. Thank you. Yeah. So, did you have a uh, Natalie? Um, yeah, I think actually typing is, that's really kind of awesome to hear, because I know that when you learn how to do that, there's a lot of kids in high school who still don't know how to type, and it's really important. You have to type all your papers, all your everything, so... I don't know what the testing, how that factors in, but just like the typing skills in general, I think is really helpful. Um, I also had a question about 
You said the report cards are gonna go to just three, two, one? Instead of four, three, two. So what is exactly like that doing, I guess? Like what's the difference? So we still have um, four is above grade level. Mm -hmm. And so really what we're trying to do is um, master standards, which is three, proficient. And um, when we talk about accelerating kids in the primary school, we're talking about really going deeper in a content rather than, oh, you're an exceptional math student. So in second grade, we're going to skip you right up to algebra which is a huge gross example, but it's really about making sure they understand the critical thinking piece of that, or how would you analyze that problem? How could you talk to us about that? How could you explain your thinking? So um, we have some wonderful supports and resources that can help us do that work, but it's um, the goal should be that proficiency, not striving to be above grade level necessarily. I, I have a question. Sure. Um, uh, in your communication, do you have um, requests or has the council um, talked about um, implementing social media strategies in, in part of that? Um, they have not <laughs> talked about it, and I neglected to say right now we have Facebook. Okay. So we definitely have an NES Facebook, which has really been... Um, we have all our media permissions. We don't name kids, but we put pictures, and that's been highlighted for parents who are thrilled to see their little ones on that. We use that for messaging. Uh, we have parent conferences tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's been out there on the NES Facebook mm -hmm. page. We, um, I'm not Twitter savvy, but um, we're learning those things, and so right now Facebook is the one that we use. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you very much. And um, Eve you, Marie, Kim. if you'd like to join us at the table, we'll go into NIS. Thank you, Kim. Welcome. Thank you. Um, it's good to be here. Um, so I can explain the format just a little bit. In my last district, we are SIPs fell right out of our district improvement plans and it was expected that the format looked the same. So thus, uh, mine looks very much like the district I, format I though. I this is very formal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it looks great. Though I liked yes, uh, I like it very much, but it did look familiar. Yes, it should. Th so, um, and I neglected, and I'll make sure when we publish on the website, we have our cover page and our acknowledgement of our school council, because that's really important too. They were part of developing this. Wonderful. And how about how many members do you have on this? We're a little small. I think we could get a little bit bigger. We have um, just two parent representatives that have come from <coughs> NES and then we have to balance that with school personnel. So it's just yeah. a little bit too small. So okay. I think we're looking to grow just a little bit bigger. Awesome. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll let you jump in. Thank you. Sure. So our first um, goal <laughs> is all about increasing student achievement and learner engagement through um, a rigorous academic curriculum that's challenging and engaging uh, for all students. Um, so it's that's our biggest goal, and you can see it's broken down the most in the ways that we hope to accomplish that. Um, one of the things that we <coughs> need to do um, is to meet together and to collaborate more robustly and more richly um, to achieve those objectives. So we have in instituted common planning time um, for every grade level team, for our special education team, and for our specialists every single week. Those things occur. There's always an administrator present, if not uh, both Elise and I. And in addition, for the grade level um, teams, we have either Jean there, because our focus is either English language arts or social studies. And for our on the opposite weeks, we have Mike Horton there when our focus is um, anything under STEM. So we've um, that's probably been a big change where it's allowed us to do a lot of work with uh, looking at student work, um, gosh, um, talking about uh, you know new standards or how we're meeting those standards or uh, imp new implementations of, for example, Eureka Math has been a hot topic for most of our meetings when we get together for math and um, digesting professional development together. Um, so that has, that has been a great way and a, a great use of our time. 
um, to get to where we need to go. Um, I, we I'm sorry, are, how sure. often does common planning time happen? Every single week. Every week. Is, is for all of those perfect. teams, for grade three, grade four, grade five, the specialist and the special education team. Great. And, and Michelle Brady's joined us with SPED. Great. And you just alternate the weeks with ELA or? or for perfect. grade level teams, yes. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Sure. Um, so we are, uh, we also hope uh, B is all about um, implementing our Eureka Math curriculum and supporting that implementation um, with professional development and uh, supplementing that with um, ST Math, which we've been working on and talking about the how and how to differentiate our math instruction. Um, Eureka, it's tough it ought to all at once learn a brand new program and at the same time learn how do you implement it in a way that hits every learner. Um, but we're working really hard at that because we know it's really important to meet kids where they are. Um, we're also um, talking about English language arts a lot this year and really trying to assess where we are with English language arts, um, how our students are performing, looking at their performance across um, multiple um, assessment pieces, also looking at the resources we're using, looking at alignment uh, across grade levels and also vertically um, from grade level to grade level. And we've recognized that we have some work to do with um, getting really uh, tightening our alignment horizontally and vertically um, so that as students are mixed back up again as they change grades, we, we can guarantee that they've had common experiences. Doesn't mean that everything's lockstep, but we wanna guarantee that they, in reading and in writing that they are um, meeting and reaching and achieving the same standards and objectives. So we're doing a lot of work there right now. Um, our, the next bullet's about um, supporting our students requiring specialized instruction and increasing collaboration um, to get that work done. And one of the ways we're doing that is through the special education meetings weekly um, in our own building. Um, also, <coughs> Our special education teachers are part of our grade level common planning times, so they're there and present and planning alongside us. Um, we also have the benefit, as uh, the other schools do, of having Michelle Brady visit us uh, monthly um, to collaborate with us. And we have um, some really wonderful consultants who are coming into our schools to support the work that we're doing to um, plan that specialized instruction for our students. And in, in our program development. And then we're also working on um, improving our instruction for our English learners. And again, collaboration is a theme everywhere we go uh, and when we talk. Um, our, the, our ESL teachers are coming to our common planning meetings. They don't go to all of them, um, but they're each at one of them so that the, we can be more aligned with strategies and methodologies used um, in, the, in the classrooms and outside of the classrooms and everybody knows what each other is doing, uh, which is really helpful. And then as um, Kim mentioned, uh, Kelly Cooney has been coming once a month too to support the entire staff with regard to um, methodologies and looking at student data and how to use that data um, to support our instruction and inform it. Um, another thing that we want to take a look at too is our how do we support our high level learners at NIS. Um, so we're really um, we're looking at all of our subgroups and how are we moving all of our students and is everything that we're doing are we rowing are we rowing in the same direction? I think that's kind of a theme for us this year. Is, is everybody working toward the same end and um, in a way that challenges everybody um, to continue to grow, no matter where they are, whether they need support to grow or whether they need to be challenged to grow? Do you have any questions about that so far? No? I just have a quick comment. Sure. I, just, I love that you have involved the aisle curriculum. <laughs> That's great. Francie does an incredible job with the kids. Yeah, she does. And I know it's a highlight for so many students to get to spend time with her. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And we want to um, 
we want to just keep looking at it and keep making sure that, uh, because it doesn't make sense um, to me that we have so many students who are doing such wonderful things with her, but our standardized test scores don't really reflect that in, in the number of students who are uh, exceeding standards. So just figuring out the why not, because we know they're capable. Right, absolutely. Yep. And of course, we're going to um, continue to use our student performance data to improve our practices. And as I mentioned, we're analyzing student work during our common planning times, during EWDs, during even during staff meetings when Kelly comes. We've taken a look at our data together, um, looking at our assessments that we are using and are they the right ones. We're, we're going to keep um, looking at that and seeing the correlation between what we're measuring and how students are performing in the classroom and then how they're performing on standardized testing. And we don't want to, uh, we certainly want to include formative assessment and, and value that as much as we value the benchmark and common assessments too, because the day-to-day the -day assessments really are what's going to help us plan appropriately for the next day and for individual students. Mm -hmm. And then um, Elise and I will, um, utilize our supervision and evaluation process to support teachers and to continue to collaborate with them and we, they know that we're there to provide actionable <laughs> feedback for them that it's it's a system that we believe in that we can really um, support and collaborate and move practice to benefit students always keeping kids at the center and what was their response to the instruction and and looking at that together and thinking about how can we how can we make it better. So we see that as part of our plan to improve instruction. Our second goal is about um, establishing and promoting a positive and safe uh, working um, culture and culture based on our shared beliefs and core values. We're a new school, so <coughs> we're in the process of. Um, talking about what it is that we all believe and what do kids need to thrive and learn and grow and making sure that uh, we all have those beliefs that all children can learn and excel and, and grow when given the right tools and strategies and methodologies. So we've been working on that. Um, we've been spending a lot of time building our group as a culture. Um, and that happens, believe it or not, formally sometimes with formal activities, but it also happens in every single meeting that we have and uh, following our group norms that we've developed together and um, you know, agreeing to collaborate uh, for, and keeping students at the center mm -hmm. all the time. So that's really influencing our culture. Um, something else we're working really hard on as a school, and it's just a continuation of the work that's been done um, at NES, is um, continuing with the implementation of social and emotional learning in our schools um, to support students' readiness to learn. We're supporting our guidance counselors. They've always taught less <coughs> social emotional learning lessons, and they're continuing to do that at NIS. And we're supporting them with providing dedicated time to that work and um, time for planning um, to grow the curriculum that they're using. Um, having a master schedule that supports um, social emotional learning, um, continuing with our responsive classroom professional development, our all of our specialists and our TAs and uh, a few others actually have been working on responsive classroom for specialists and others is the title of the book and they're really engaged in that learning so that we can be school wide um, using the same language and um, really growing our school to be as responsive as possible um, for kids. And what else do we have there? Oh, just the consistency. We've had a lot of conversations and staff meetings about school-wide expectations and how we can support one another so that kids always know what the expectations are in our school. And I think that just supports them and, and the idea that if somebody um, forgets an expectation or has a day that they're not following the expectation that it's our job to teach and teach and teach again um, because they're little still and then our safety and security team has been meeting um, regularly um, as as they are in all of the schools to support that that work as well to keep our school uh, secu secure 
And then our third goal, our um, school council decided to separate it out and make it its own goal, and it's to promote and nurture school partnerships with families and the community, and working hard um, to do that through uh, really uh, increasing the classroom communications um, through their their own newsletters um, and giving providing feedback to staff about, and most of them are already doing it, but think about ways you can encourage families to support the learning at home. It should just, it shouldn't be just, this is what we've done or this is what we're doing, but also offering suggestions and links and things like that to really help families um, to support that learning. And we have our second coffee tomorrow, which will be fun, and have um, some folks come on in, and we have regular um, community folks coming in to support our learning too, as well as us going out to support the learning. So I'm learning as I go just how many community organizations there are who are willing to come in and um, um, enrich the learning that we're doing at school. Any questions or comments from committee members? How much turn it's been for your coffee so far, your morning? Well, we just had the one so far, and okay. tomorrow's our second. Okay. And I think we had about a dozen people at our first <clears throat> one, which I, I don't know if that's, that's low, high. Yeah, yeah, I'm just wondering in general if this is still an effective way to be pulling our families in, if we have good numbers or if we're sitting there talking to one or two people. Yeah. So are you looking for me to <laughs> rise to the bait? Yeah. Um, I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think maybe the, the time has come for us to find other ways. Um, w when you have a topic that brings out a large group, when you have 20 or 25, then you say, okay, this is, this is worth it. Um, I think the last one that Kim had, you had two people. Three people. Three people. Yeah. And you had... Two, three administrators. Three administrators. Three um, so I, I do think that that's something that we need to look at and say, okay, um, maybe that that idea's time has come, yeah. and we can um, find a better way to engage them on a particular topic, maybe a forum here and there, instead of the. Uh, just well-established coffees. Mm -hmm. now, I have one Thursday, so uh, I'll let you know <laughs> yeah, what I get for, for numbers. But uh, I would say when you bring the community together in your meetings, ask them what would yeah. be a better way to... But when you only have two people there... It's hard to... No, no. Hard to, oh, okay. Like it's serving. Council meeting. <clears throat> That's something we could talk about school before council. school yes. councils mm -hmm. all together and have that. We did make some reductions this year to the number of copies, so we're not doing right. them once a month, but six, and we're trying to do purpose fall. So our beginning of the year one was um, all about helping your child at home, and we probably had 30 people at that mm -hmm. And then we had three the other day. I just remember when it first started out, it was so exciting. You know, parents were so eager to go to the coffees and hear what what you had to say, and I just, I feel like it's, it's you know, it's time to... Yeah. Get creative. I mean, we, we jokingly say um, the way to get numbers is to do something wrong. And then people will come out and, um, you know, in, out of concern. So um, that's certainly tongue in cheek. I don't think anybody they're trying to do something wrong. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Committee members? Oh, uh, I don't know if it's a comment, but I'm just um, thinking about Kim's mention of getting students used to keyboards and that sort of thing and based on this being the first year that we've broken the students apart in IS and ES if you do that is there going to be pickup in IS for that it's a good question and um, we teams have talked about that as being a challenge that students don't know how to do that but I will tell you it's really difficult and challenging to give up instructional time to keyboard and I don't know where to put it in or, or what to, what do you give up I just think it's something we need to think about bridging mm -hmm. gaps the mm -hmm. last thing we need is it's it's gaps um, you start something and not be able to carry it through and then you have gap and then you're you don't have improvement where we need improvement, um, whether it be test scores or anything else. 
So that's just something to think about. Just make sure you guys are collaborating together on something like that. I think we're all always chasing that. If, if you go back in years to penmanship, um, and then there, are every 20 years, there's a movement to bring back cursive writing. Um, and I'm sitting here thinking, okay, we're teaching them to keyboard, and, and quite honestly, typing in high school was the best course um, I ever had. Me too. I didn't, I didn't yeah. enjoy it at the yeah. time. But when I got into college, mm -hmm. to Natalie's point, it was a very useful yeah. skill. But the um, technology is already there to have voice. Um, and so I wonder how soon keyboarding will become, you know, passe mm -hmm. and, a, and a lost art. And so you're always sort of, sort of chasing that. And it is a quandary. I know that in the elementary school they talk about, okay, we can't lose penmanship you know we can't lose that that art um, but it, it is increasingly difficult to say okay with everything that we have to do how are we going to fit the five quarts into a gallon container I think it's like what you talked about though Mike when we were talking about strategic planning is that technology is not separate or other than right. regular curriculum learning and so I think as long as you know, familiarity with technology is a part of how students are learning in all of their different curricula, that's going to prepare them for those spring tests when they have to, to navigate a computer. I think, you know, the, the reality is that understanding beyond just keyboarding, understanding how to navigate a screen mm -hmm. and select an answer or input an answer is the, the way that the, the state and um, the country are expecting us to assess our students. So I'm really looking forward to that conversation as we get into strategic planning about how that vertical alignment that we talk about with curriculum, how technology is be, being woven in so it's not something you have to find right. extra time for in a day. Right. It's a part of how students are learning. Right. And, and it absolutely is. We yeah. definitely are using technology in, in writing and mm -hmm. um, in math a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but, but as far as the art of keyboarding and home row, yeah. we're not necessarily teaching yeah. that specifically. Uh, I Thank you. And before sure. I turn it over to Natalie, I just wanted to comment that um, one, congratulations. I think this is a really wonderful plan for a new school. And um, I particularly appreciate the theme of collaboration and learning and understanding. I think um, we have high expectations every year from all of our administrators at all of our schools, but you're at a particularly steep learning curve with a new building, uh, new relationships. And um, I think that collaboration is probably the single best thing you could do to build a sense of community among your staff and the students. So I, I applaud that and from you and your council in this. Did you have any Thank questions you. though? Um, I was just gonna, is there no like computer lab lost anymore? Like we used to actually have like a computer lab class. And I don't know if it was like an elective that we like rotated in and out of, mm -hmm. or it was like mm -hmm. music and then, but we actually like went to the computer lab and everybody mm -hmm. did stuff on computers. Is that not a thing anymore? So no. we have the benefit of Chromebooks in every oh, classroom <laughs> from grades three through five. Mm -hmm. But our librarian, Laura Coburn, is a technology. She is a technology integration specialist or media specialist in addition to being a librarian. So mm -hmm. she does incorporate um, that in the work that yeah. they do. But it's more about meeting the digital literacy standards than it is about keyboarding. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Eve Marie. Thank you. Thank and you. I'll invite Peter up. Thank you. Mr. Cohen for the Cyrus Pierce Middle School. Well, you have a big old council, don't you? I do. The council heavy. I do. Uh, so, uh, t t two editorials. One, to piggyback on what you said, Melissa, I want to really commend uh, Eve Marie and Elise. Uh, they have a, a lot more heavy lifting to do than, than the rest of us in terms of creating a plan for a brand new school. It's really impressive, and we're hearing great things, and it's awesome working with them. So I was glad to hear you highlight that. And I also just love the fact that um, our, our senior and high school representative has just framed herself as being old by <laughs> citing <laughs> computer labs and obsolete 
technology, it's pretty amazing how rapidly we're we're progressing. <laughs> um, so, uh, in the past, the uh, the CPS improvement plan. I'm gonna. Um, you can kind of skip to the last page. That's what I'm gonna highlight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, in the past, we've structured our improvement plan with four goals under the categories of instruction, intervention, innovation, and imagination. Um, and uh, this year, uh, following the directives of the of the school committee and the superintendent, and and the recent re uh, release of our MCAS scores, we've uh, redeveloped our improvement plan to be focused on on simply one goal, focus on, focusing in on improving our, our student achievement and MCAS scores. So what you see here is is one goal, but it's it's one very meaty goal um, in order to um, really focus our attention on student achievement uh, growth over the next few years. Um, so you'll see um, the uh, the timeline. It starts with um, the measurement of uh, the new scores, which the state has has told us is the new baseline, the 2017 MCAS data. So that'll serve as our baseline data for our improvement um, between now and and um, 2020. Um, and so our hope is that by 2020, where um, you know at or above state at the state average um, in ELA and math and science, um, but in each interim year, we hope that what we see is an increase in the number of kids meeting expectations, exceeding expectations on that on that measurement, and decreasing the number of students that are not meeting expectations. So um, we hope to see progress every year. So what this goal does is it is it focuses in um, student achievement in, in three areas. Um, one is is the importance of professional development and professional development that's really focused. So this year, for example, um, we've uh, zeroed in on on the issue of student engagement. We've had a, um, a guest presenter, her name is Crystal McGill. Uh, she came and met with our staff, worked <coughs> with our staff for a full day in August. She came back for a full day in October, and she'll come back in January. And what's been nice about that is in the interim, we can sustain the work that our staff has done with with Crystal McGill um, and connect it to the other things that we're that we're working on, um, lesson planning, and curriculum development, um, and it's it's sustained. So rather than have just sort of a drive by of of one topic and then another drive by of another topic, it's all focused on on this same uh, theme. So focused professional development is one of the keys to this to this improvement plan and, and keys to what we're working on at CPS. Then it's it's really always about time um, and and making sure that we're providing time for um, our educators to be able to develop the the um, curriculum. Um, and so uh, that's uh, kind of at the heart of this goal, um, using as much time as we can possibly find to um, provide teachers with um, uh, the, the, the strategies they need, the scaffolding they need, the support they need uh, to be able to develop uh, the curriculum, to really know the standards at each grade level. Um, they've spent time unpacking those, those standards and now developing curriculum units. And then once the curriculum units are in place, going down to that more granular uh, lesson plan level. And, and that's where, again, the connection between the student engagement and being thoughtful about that is connected uh, back. Um, this work could could not uh, be possible at the level that it that it's happening right now without uh, Donna Johnson, our assistant principal. She's done unbelievable work um, o overseeing this and and laying out structure for our teachers and and being a resource uh, for them um, on top of all the other things that she does. So it's it's really quite remarkable uh, work. We've also tried to include um, this year. Um, uh, we've uh, tried to have more classroom walkthroughs um, so that uh, not just Donna and I have a sense of what's going on in our classrooms, we're in classrooms on a, on a fairly regular basis, um, but including um, the directors. So the director of social services, the director of, of um, English learners, uh, the, the two curriculum directors. Um, so we're looking forward to having um, uh, more walkthroughs so that then there's there's more context for some of the coaching and, and that we can provide for our teachers um, 
I really want to uh, highlight the work that uh, Kelly Cooney has done. You're going to hear from her um, tonight, probably around midnight or so when we're uh, at that <laughs> port part of the, the presentation. Um, and she's come in and, and we fit the ground running right from when she was hired last spring. She and I started talking about how important it will be to walk through classrooms together. And so we've been able to, to uh, put that in action right away. And then she comes into our faculty meetings and we can share out here are some of the things that we're seeing. Here are some tips and tricks and strategies for things that can work, not just for L's, but for all of our students. Um, uh, we uh, did a similar walkthrough of classrooms with, with Gene Witt recently, and we're looking forward to doing that with, with Michael Horton and with Michelle Brady as well to really help um, provide as much support for our teachers as, as possible. Um, then the, the third part of, besides the curriculum development and the professional development, um, is the data and making sure that we really know the data. And so um, that work started last, last year. We've looked at data every year, of course, but last year um, uh, Donna create, created a, uh, a spreadsheet for teachers, but she did the, the data entry and we kind of shared it out. And this year we've really had teachers not only inputting the data, but really getting dirty and looking uh, in to do deep data dives and, and, and really know our students on an individual basis based on the assessment data. And so that's helped um, not just knowing their assessment scores, but also developing an advisory program so we get to know the students as students. Um, and um, also having students really recognize and be aware of the data so they know their own strengths and, and weaknesses. And so each student at CPS this year is developing uh, their own digital portfolio to, to track their progress, um, which will hopefully stay with them for, for the sixth graders for all three years of middle school. They can kind of track set goals and, and track their, their progress towards those goals over the course of their, their middle school career. So there's some exciting things happening, um, but we've really tried to <coughs> shift the focus of this improvement plan to um, as much as possible a singular focus, even though you see like how meaty and not everybody's favorite word because it's overused, but robust this <laughs> this plan is. So I'll take questions if you have them. Uh, any committee members? So <clears throat> thank you, Peter, for um, your presentation. And I like the fact that you have focused professional development. But I have to tell you, I really need to see your plan show how you plan to obtain some of these goals or uh, your one goal. We can't just have one goal. We'd love to, I think, in a perfect world. I think you've stated what we all like to say, but it, it's just not, to me, realistic. Uh, we'd love to be have great scores on the MCAS, and that's we really should focus on that and try to figure out where our weaknesses lie and work with those. But I really need to see how you plan to obtain them in, in some sort of deep, we need something to measure by. That's that's what I have to say. So, so the measurement from uh, our perspective is is the MCATs. That's how that's how you as a school committee have, have said we're going to be measured. That's how that's how the state has said we're going to be measured. So that's where we focused it on on that. So that's the measurement tool. Is, is but we're the, not going to teach. MCATs. We we say time and time again we're not going to teach to the MCAT. We cannot. It's just not realistic, and it's not going to prepare our students for high school for the next step. So we got to figure this out, and I think this needs a little work. Well, uh, again, I would say that um, that is the tool that we're measured by, um, whether we like it or not. And so what you see here is focusing on what we can control to achieve those scores, which is um, focusing on improving instruction, um, increasing student engagement. Um, how are you going to measure the improvement? But again, we're back to that. So if, if I can jump in, um, I, I think <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that um, Peter and Donna have done, to, to your point, and, and we'll show you in the workshop that we're going to do, is um, he has triangulated data from MCAS, from uh, the measures of academic um, progress, which is a standardized formative assessment that gives you, and, um, and then the, the report cards. So they're looking, he has a, um, 
a profile, which again, we'll show you in a couple of weeks, with every student on it comparing the MCAS score of the child to their report card to the MAP testing. So that is, that's one way. So it's not just MCAS. Um, what I think parents want to see is not so much the MCAS score in isolation, but what is that MCAS score in relation to my child's grade? Because if you're getting, if you're getting um, a high grade, an A, but you're not meeting expectations on MCAS, there's a disconnect. So they're looking at that information and finding out, and then they're adding the third leg of that stool with the um, measures of academic progress. It's, it's a pretty interesting and informative um, document so that they can project on one hand on, based on MAP how students might do on MCAS. Um, but the, the real work, and then teachers want to look at, okay, how, is, how does my grade for this child or the grade that the child earned um, correlate to these other measurements? But can so, I interject for one moment? Yeah. They're not really being graded. They don't have a numerical grade to go by. So that, I think, could be a little more challenging, too, to decipher what does meeting the standards mean. For a parent, I'm just saying it's hard sure. for a parent. So we're trying to make it consistent uh, to, so that they're being measured on progress towards standards because everything else that they're assessed on is progress towards standards. So our, what our directive is from the state is to teach to standards, the common core standards. And so that's what we are doing. That's how we're measuring them. Um, so I don't, I personally don't know what an 83 means. If you told me I'm an 83 student in, in right. math, I don't know what that means. But if you break down the specific standards um, of math and tell me that I can, you know, I can multiply and I can divide, but for some reason I can't uh, subtract, well, then I know more specifically uh, what I can do and where I need to put Which more work. Which goes along with investigating other means of reporting to parents because I think we can find better ways to describe what meeting the standards entails and I think that's something you're looking into. Absolutely, right. Uh, which, is, which is part of this. Is the, that's, the, that's why standards-based grading appears in this plan because uh, then the, in the work that we're doing developing curriculum, part of curriculum development is also a development of assessments. And so are we um, effectively designing assessments in our classrooms, not just not just MAP or MCAS, so the standard assessments, but are we designing as educators assessments that really give us information? Do we know that question three on the math test that we give really assesses a specific standard? And so the only way you can do that is if you really know the standard. So that that's the work that we're doing with our with our teachers on a, on a regular basis. And making basis. it clear for families, hopefully, as they're reading it, because it's, it's a lot to take in as yeah. a parent to get the numbers of your, your child's MCAS score scores and then to you know what does this mean where is my child at so hopefully I, and I just think the plan should spell it out a little bit more detail like you just said I, I can't get that from reading this it's what I'm saying okay and I also know that Peter has worked with fifth grade teachers as well um, with trying to assess where the incoming sixth graders are and grouping them in classrooms and that, that's the other piece I didn't want to kind of steal my own thunder from the next presentation Sorry. that I have to give but, Sorry. but we'll, t we'll talk about that piece okay. as well in, in, the right. ma in the math presentation about mm -hmm. um, some of that work mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I just well. want us to be careful I mean years ago we were accused of teaching to the test where to get us and then we changed a little bit and now we're saying uh, you know going back to it, I just you know we really have to evaluate dig it apart, figure it out, set a goal, set a plan, just for, and see if we can make a change. For the record, we're, we're teaching to standards, standards yeah. and the test assesses our progress towards those standards. So um, just, I 
never, people that know me know that I have never been accused of teaching to the MCAS because uh, I, I don't typically even mention the word MCAS. I think as well, far as I'm concerned, it's a four letter word. Think of but a that parent. is how we're measured. Think of a parent. So, so what I want to do is make sure if we're met, if that test is measuring progress towards standards, that we're not surprised by the results, that we want to be able to do everything we can to prepare our kids to be able to meet those standards so that it's a predictor of how they're going to do on that, that state assessment. I that, would think that, that we've been exist. doing that all along, though. Have we not? It's a brand new test. It is, and I would also say that we've had indications continually that improvement needs to be made. So I, for one, actually appreciate the sort of isolated focus of, at this point, you know, and, and I think we'll hear a lot more about math in a little bit, but it's time to shake the snow globe and really make sure that um, in all the areas that we're responsible for making sure that the standards are being um, taught and consumed, that we're being that that we're, we're being the most effective. Yeah. And I think that's um, maybe not spelled out as eloquently here as you know that it could be, but I actually um, I actually agree that you know we've seen um, test scores and made a lot of um, uh, steer test correction or corrections to make sure that the kids are making improvements mm. and there's a disconnect somewhere and I think this is a deeply investigative process to figure out where that disconnect is between how we're seeing them perform on some assessments and then how they're testing on the statewide assessment and, and ultimately that does reflect on the entire district if we don't look at that and, and have some focused attention on it and God forbid you know, don't do well next year, we don't want those consequences for the district of going um, backwards in our, our um, whatever it's called. Accountability. Accountability. Thank you. Um, so this, to, 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 to be quite candid, this is a tricky conversation because I, I feel like in some ways there's, there's mixed messages. So on the one hand, there's the message that our scores are not good enough. What are we going to be doing about that? And so we've tried to create a plan that addresses that, that concern. Mm -hmm. At the expense of, as I, I led with, we used to have uh, categories in addition to instruction and intervention, things like innovation and imagination, which is no longer in here, um, which takes a little piece of my heart and throws it out and stomps on it because to me it, it we could should be doing we have an opportunity to be really innovative and ima and, and, and imagine what we could do and and instead we're focused so much on on test scores that um, it's it's a shame so I, I would love to have a, a conversation about what we can do that's totally different um, and I would predict that even with those very kind of out of the box approaches, we would st we would still get the, the same results. So I would I would welcome that opportunity and and uh, and that conversation uh, moving forward. But I think that you know the directive has been very clear. Our scores are not where they should be. So we've created a plan that's going to address that, and we can control the things that we can control, which is that we have teachers that get the professional development that they need and the time that they need to really know their curriculum to be able to deliver. Uh, deliver it effectively to students and and the results should come with that that's what the, the schools that score the best on on the MCAS never talk about the MCAS itself they talk about instruction mm -hmm. they talk about and, how to kids make progress towards those standards thank you. And one of the things I like about um, this approach is um, understanding each individual student and I and I, I looked at Pauline when you said that and I smiled because I think she and I have had conversations of wouldn't it be a fantastic world if every kid had an IEP, right? Absolutely. You know, and I think we're coming to the unavoidable conclusion that as educators and administrators, that's we have to um, really dig so deeply into understanding how each individual student is doing so that they um, are set up for success, not just for a test, absolutely not just for a test but that their understanding of the standards is such that they're competent and capable as they move on to the next levels. Um, the other thing that we're really, uh, you know, we had a workshop today and we've, we've embraced the idea of like that, you know, we are in a uh, unique situation where, um, you know, there's, there's one seventh grade math teacher, there's one eighth grade math teacher, there's one seventh grade English teacher. And so it's really, the scores become really personal and we've tried to break that down that these are our scores. 
not just CPS, they're our scores. So I love that this meeting was uh, started off with, with 35 outstanding students being highlighted. Well, guess what? Like, um, I'd love to give John all the credit, but John would be the first to tell you, like, he, he couldn't have the numbers continue to grow without the work that's being done at NES and now NIS and CPS. So that's that's our data. So we're getting them there. Like, we're doing we're doing really great things in this district, and we're producing some really great students. Um, and even Natalie, who's you know, kind of old before her time, is an outstanding <laughs> uh, example of the fact that we're producing these great students. Um, her contributions to this meeting is really impressive. Um, because that's what it's about, the student. So it's great that there's a student at this table because that's what it's about. It's not, it's not about um, anything else than making sure that we're producing the best possible students coming out of Nantucket uh, High School as we possibly can, and we all own that. So it's, it's great that in this meeting, we started with, with highlighting achievements that could not be possible without the work that was done at NES and CPS. So Peter, are you then saying, just to sort of answer Zona's question of, of measurement, is the measurement of success in this school improvement plan an improvement in MCAS scores alone? Or are you looking for other broader improvements as well? I think other broader improvements will come. Mm -hmm. I think that that the ultimate measure, the thing that, that um, as Carrie is probably writing away in her notepad mm -hmm. over there, mm -hmm. that, that thing that makes headlines is our MCAS score. So if that's what we're going to be measured at, and and it's and we're that's our goal is to have students meet the grade level standards, mm -hmm. then then that ultimately is is the that the measurement that that we're going by. And so perhaps a, a recommendation to you and the council would be to add this fifth column of you know how do we know that we've met this um and and if we can you know see that achievement that's you know broad that includes the mcas sure. and other assessments i think that would go a long way to um assuring everybody and and stating it very clear in a public document that it's not solely mcas mm -hmm. but that we're we're looking for improved outcomes in, in other areas and that that would that Sure. satisfy that um yeah we kind of shifted the column to the top like yeah it's basically what we did but we can yeah. format it perfect anyway i just said it needed a little more meat for the you know measurement mm -hmm. right right yes a comment just, just i think having that uh, digital portfolio and having the students taking responsibility and having knowledge and gaining knowledge on this their growth mm -hmm. is invaluable because i think as they go into high school um, not only will they have the information, their family will have the information, the teachers will have the information because the state requires us to have certain tests to pass, in, to pass graduation. I think that that will help the students that do struggle in that area so that they can, if they are repeating math or biology or English language arts, that they have the skill set and the knowledge to be able to dissect into looking at where their deficiencies are and being able to advocate for themselves as well as our teachers being more prepared to help them to overall a greater success for all students. But I, you know, I hit th th this is it's a painful conversation and it is part of it is reality of what we are given and, and the, the task at hand. But at the same time, I think. And I, I'm sure it hurts you because I, you are creative and you, you do lead your school with creativity and innovation. And, and so, you can't leave, lose that. But I don't want you to lose that. I want you to continue that as, as well because that's important for our kids. Yeah. Thanks. Natalie. Any what do you got? Thanks, <laughs> Nina. Um, I think the thing about the MCAS is that you know you learn how to take it like since elementary school, you know, there's how to structure that open response, how to take that test. Um, and some kids maybe don't pick it up until it's drilled into you 10th grade when you need to pass, but it really comes down to whether, you know, you know it or you don't. And that's what, you know, if a kid knows it and they see it, then they'll, they'll do it. Um, so I think it shouldn't be, you know, MCAS clearly needs to improve, but like there's, it should really be about the, what's happening in the classroom. I think that's important to remember. And is the standard-based rating, so is that, I know you mentioned like you're not an 83, is that, so is it gonna be a whole new like number system? What exactly is mm -hmm. that? Yep, the whole new number system in that there's no numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so numbers. it'll be aligned to, uh, it'll be aligned to, um, 
uh, standards. So either you're making meeting expectations, yep, partially meeting expectations, or not meeting expectations towards the standards. Interest. So will students still be graded on certain assignments and certain tests? It'll just factor into like a bigger one, two, three, four type thing. Right. See, so you've you've learned the game of school very well, yes, and I have. and the game's changing, um, and and so. Um, because because we want to see where their progress is being made towards the standards, we want that we want students to know specifically what are their strengths and weaknesses. What specific skills can they do? Not just math eighty three, but each specific uh, standard. What they can and, and can't do yet, and and how do we then close that gap so that they can do it? So they will be getting. Assignment? <laughs> they they will, but but it's it's uh, a progression. So you may you know take an assessment, and it may indicate that you're not doing well on dividing fractions, and so then you'll go back and have to do some uh, uh, reteaching and relearning of of uh, dividing fractions, and then you get assessed again, and so maybe the next time instead of not meeting the standard on dividing fractions, you're partially meeting uh, the standard, and then eventually. <laughs> by the end of the year, you're meeting that, that uh, standard. So students not only will be able to track their progress, as will parents, but um, uh, the, the the teachers will be able to give regular feedback on each of those different standards in terms of how they're progressing, instead of just uh, you know five out of five out of ten at the top. Okay. <clears throat> um, the only other comment that I had, um, and I. I I hope that this um, doesn't get lost, but I really think that in um, middle school, the differentiated instruction becomes so important, particularly not just for our students who um, need assistance, but for our advanced students who need challenges. And I think we really start to see that need heighten in middle school. And uh, I would just, in I just want to say it out loud and encourage us to not lose focus on how we're going to meet the needs of those kids who need a more rigorous academic <clears throat> challenge. Yep. So it, 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 one of the bullets in here is proactively including strategies for differentiation. That's on all ends. Mm -hmm. um, and again, in the in the math presentation, I'll talk to you a little bit Great. about um, accelerating math. Great. Well, at the middle school. Thank you very much. We'll see you in a few minutes. All right. Can't and wait. Dr. Bucky. <laughs> Aren't you lucky? You have about 38 Super. seconds. Gosh, <laughs> Just kidding. Mm. Yes, this is going to be a lot of things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we, we, we missed a meeting. It is so. usually. Yes. Quote Mr. Kozort's predecessor. Hello. <laughs> it's good to be the last person uh, to go because much of what is contained in the high school school improvement plan you have seen mirrored at NES, NIS, and CPS. Um, I want to recognize the school council who helped us develop the plan. Uh, Mark Chittister is a new parent rep, and Jill Rothke is not new to school councils, but she is new to the high school school council. And then with Ms. Sarah Dellis, uh, moving up to the assistant principal, she had been on the school council uh, <coughs> last year, and so Anthony Supa is a new member of our school council. Um, we work this year, um, This we have a three-year rolling plan, as you're aware of. Mm -hmm. So this is the 2017 to 2020. Um, we work to better align the high school plan with the district plan. I wasn't as creative as my new colleague, Eve Marie, to put it in the better format, to better align with the district plan. But um, the four overarching themes of the high school is academic achievement, safety, um, communication and connections, and culture. Um, also being fourth to go, I know to avoid any mention of typing or the word robust <laughs> in my presentation. So um, you can see uh, that under each of the goals that we have, there are various metrics that we use. And then in the addenda, it gives you our progress to date um, with how we're doing. I don't do the year-to-year -year comparisons uh, in the addenda. It is a three-year rolling average compared against uh, the most recent graduating class. Um, I was talking to somebody today. Um, I thought I would open it to you if you have questions concerning how uh, we achieve uh, these metrics. I'm sure you've had a chance to read through the plan and maybe some numbers jumped out at you or uh, some things. I just wanted to draw your attention to a couple things. On goal two, 
um, fourth goal down, provide ongoing programs. This was something the school council uh, wanted to tighten up the wording. Um, and so it says provide ongoing programs where students feel safe, safe sharing with an adult concerns about various topics like bullying, suicide prevention, substance use, uh, and potential violence. Um, so we're, we're able to make progress in that through our advisory program, um, through assemblies, through our partnership um, with community organizations, the FOMPs, uh, ASAP. Um, we have the student support team that meets weekly. Um, so we're able to gauge our progress there. And then goal four in and of itself um, is a direct link uh, to the district improvement plan. And I thought with a new administrator coming on this year, the council agreed uh, that we want to improve the working learning culture <coughs> while integrating the new assistant principal into the leadership structure of our school. And then we just list some ways uh, that we go about that and uh, attempt to monitor that. Like uh, the other schools, we're doing um, faculty meetings with the director of special services to better serve our students uh, uh, with special needs. We're doing uh, faculty meetings with the L director. Uh, we will be initiating walkthroughs with the L director, the SPED director, as is happening at, at the middle school, also with the director of STEM and humanities just as another lens, not necessarily evaluative, but giving us information that can then be the basis for faculty meetings for focused areas for improvement. Mm -hmm. So with that, rather quick, um, I can go on, but if you have specific questions um, from information in the plan, I'd be happy to answer those. Anyone on that end of the table have a comment or question? I just I, I would love to see a little bit more about how you plan, what your strategy is. I see the objectives, but it would be nice to see what the strategy for meeting that objective is in your improvement goals. Um, you know, for instance, how do you plan to increase the percentage of students attending school daily? You know, it would be nice mm -hmm. to know what your plan is. So we have a tiered attendance system uh, that we use and the student support team that meets weekly um, looks at attendance data and uh, the people that are on that group uh, will bring a student forward. Um, the student handbook outlines our process for attendance, but it could include such things as a home visit through the school social worker, uh, the school resource officers, letters home, meetings with counselors, um, so you do have a strategy. It would just be helpful to know what that is. In so maybe we'll add a column to that outline strategies. Nice. That'd that be would great. be nice. Thank you. So, Natalie, <clears throat> now's uh -oh. your chance. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think I'm, I'm set, actually. Okay. okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, <clears throat> John, thank you. You went over the 38 seconds allotted, but we won't penalize you this time. <laughs> thank you very thank you, much. Um, and I'm, at this point, welcome Kelly Cooney. Um, and I, Kelly, are you doing a PowerPoint presentation? So if, if committee members would like to go sit in the audience, we'll give Kelly the floor. Be careful. <laughs> oh, one, one last quick comment before. I, I just wanted to make a... a, a comment that um, I'm very impressed um, at the collaboration of the full administrative team and, and Kelly and Michelle's participation in each building um, with the administrators and the staff. I think that was a really notable um, theme throughout the, the school improvement plan. So thank you to you both for doing that. So first of all, I want to say um, thank you to all of you. I still am finding my job to be absolutely delightful. I love being a member of the team and the community. Thank you to the ESL teachers. They were in PD with me all day from 8 until 4, and now they're here. So thank you so much for coming tonight. It's been really amazing working with them as well. So thanks, team. So the mission of our English Learner Program is to provide research um, validated, systematic, explicit, and sustained language instruction to English language learners. That's part of the state's new definition for what ESL is. So the strategies and the methodologies and the templates that I'm sharing with the ESL teachers is not stuff that I dream up in my head that I think is good. It's stuff that we, we in the state of Massachusetts, have recently developed new ESL MCUs and a guidance document 
that's been adopted by WIDA. We belong to their consortium, and they're looking to us now for guidance, and it's been, um, people are using them in, the in our country and across the world. So we, we, everything's based on research. So we have articles to back up why we do the strategies that we do or why we've planned our units the way that we have. Um, and our goal is also to develop social, instructional, and academic language within the four domains, speaking, listening, reading, and writing, in conjunction with subject matter, math, science, social studies, and ELA. So that's kind of a lot to digest. So I think people used to think that ESL was either four pencils, these are four blue pencils, those are six green pencils, and or that it somehow was attached to ELA. But in the world, we don't walk around talking about ELA all the time. We use language for purposes. So either to make a doctor's appointment or to do math or to discover the cause and effects of a science problem or um, social studies problem. So that's where we focus is on the academic language is that that is transferable. And we explicitly focus on listening and speaking as well as reading and writing in all subject areas. So education does not transform the world. Education changes people and it's people that change the world. And our goal as, as an L team is that we want to provide our skill, our kids with the skills necessary to be able to have success in college and career readiness and to, to change the world so that it's a better place than, than it is now. So that's ultimately our goal. Our enrollment this year, right now, we're at two, it's, it's actually changed since I made this <laughs> just this last week, last week, but we're at about 293. Um, if you compare our NES and IS numbers today or last week at 180 um, compared to a year ago, oh, that 1030 should say 1017. Sorry, I changed that too, but I don't know. 1017 it should say. Um, so we, we've gone up quite a bit just since last year, and the bulk of those numbers are at NES. We did have quite a few kids, however, um, add, come to our school in all buildings, even just since September. So we had three at the middle school just in this past week. So they're, they're still coming. We've had a 651% increase in the past 12 years. That's compared to the state. They think that their slide is exciting because they have a 70% increase. We have completely wow. beat the state on that one. So, so I find myself in this role kind of um, working with our principals, which is great, and with other um, people at central office and our teachers. And there's the common kind of how has ESL changed in the past five years, the methodologies, the fact that we're linked to the common core standards and all practices. And also, we have a huge influx here. Other districts have had more time to put systems in place. So I'm working on systems as well as teaching and learning. I prefer teaching and learning to systems, but systems have to be in place in order for everything else to work. So here's another slide. This data is um, reflective of March 1 data that the st state then collected and put up recently on their website, so the numbers aren't accurate, but it gives you a comparison. Um, Nantucket has 28%, 29% students who speak English as um, a second language. So that means we have students at home who's, who aren't English language learners. They're not still in our program acquiring enough English to be able to survive in the mainstream without ESL support. We have far more than the state does at 20%. So those kids might be um, students whose parents speak another language, and from day one they were bilingual. And some of those students also are our former English language learners, either those who were still monitoring or those who exited the program, you know, maybe in elementary school and they're in high school, they're bilingual, um, but they're not in ESL classes. And as of that data, it was 16% English learners in Nantucket compared to 9% at the state. So we have almost twice as many here in Nantucket than the state does. So we look like our, our numbers, our percentage totals, are more comparable to the Fall Rivers, the Southbridge, the Holyoaks, the places where they're known as gateway cities because they are welcoming people from other countries. So right now our number is 18%, so it's gone up since the state collected that data just last March 1. So here are our totals by grade. 
So we screened in kindergarten, the ESL team, um, the, uh, the uh, NES screened over like 85 kids this summer. And of those 85, um, 38 were English learners. And then we also screened for the first time um, pre-K. So screening pre-K is now mandated by the federal and the state government. So that was also new this year. Of our time, not 293 English language learners, 35 have special needs. 19 are opt-outs, so that means that they're still English language learners, just the parents have said we do not want that extra dose of ESL classes. So those students still take our, our access test, which measures the English language development and um, the, the kind of the um, burden or the pleasure of making sure those kids grow their English language enough to show progress on that test lies solely on the core content teachers. They don't have access to the ESL teachers because the parents do not want them pulled out or pushed in for that program. We have 58 fells, so that means um, kids who used to be English language learners that we are aware of that we captured correctly in our systems, so in our um, student management system. I suspect they are, there are more, I just don't think we were collecting the data properly 10 years ago and eight years ago when we were new to having L's and we didn't have systems in place. Some of those kids were still monitoring. That's new this year um, that we're really going to heavily monitor the kids and follow all the state guidance on that. So it's, it's systems things that we're implementing. Um, 32 of those are, are ever L's. So diversity, 86% um, of our English language learners speak Spanish at home and then we have a sprinkling of other languages our students come from all over the world, which is so exciting. It brings a huge asset to our, to our community. So the requirements of instruction uh, for English language learners, this is kind of tricky. Um, we, the state put out retail a few years ago. That was in direct response to the federal government saying to Massachusetts, if we took the rest of the country out of your data, you're number one in the country. So that's something to celebrate. I tell our teachers that, and not usually teachers are surprised because usually we're focusing on our negatives. So Massachusetts is number one in the country. We compete internationally with Singapore, Finland, Denmark if we get rid of all the other states. So when the feds looked at our data, they said, you're really good with your regular ed. Your gap between regular ed and English language learners is, is wider than other places. So you know what you're doing, but clearly you're not focusing on. So they were looking at our achievement gap. So they came in and they threatened to take over the Massachusetts Department of English Language Learners and instead just put them on kind of an improvement plan and that's why retail existed. So all of our teachers had to take, all content teachers had to take the SEI endorsement and still I think um, some districts are a little further along with embracing what does that mean. So it's, it's not just the ESL teachers doing magic for an hour or two a day. ESL, English language learners belong to all teachers, everyone in the district, every administrator, all of us are L teachers, just some of us are ESL because that's its own subject matter. So to be an ESL teacher, you have a degree in English as a second language, you learn things like applied linguistics, you learn things about the power dynamics of language, how dialects become language, like English was a dialect at one point, French was a dialect at one point, who has the powers, the one that codifies it, makes it a language. That's what we study when we do applied linguistics. So we have ESL teachers and then we have sheltered English immersion. These are all of our core content teachers have to be endorsed and they learn how to scaffold so that English learners can understand the content and also scaffolds so that they can output what they know. And you have to meet the students at where they are. In Nantucket, we have the model, we have sheltered content. We do SEI plus ESL. I, of course, always talk about this option and I think that's one that we might want to explore once we I get my, my, my feet on the ground here, and we've got some good ESL going. Do language is something that we are ripe for because we have 20% of a population that would bring, that would be a way for us to be able to share in the assets of bilingualism and globalism so that our monolingual families also can be bi bilingual. So, but we don't do that here in Massachusetts. We can do it, and there's been a huge movement to bring that back. So that's me thinking long-term, if the community wanted it, we'd put a system in place think about it for a year and then determine that. So again, ESL is a separate content, separate license. The goal is to accelerate English language development. So we want to get them to the place where we exit them from ESL and they're just in the mainstream. SEI is all content teachers. They also differentiate for English language learners in their classroom. So kids get a double dose. 
These are our teachers. So um, VESI is shared right now between NES and I NIS. It's a little bit difficult because we have so many kids at NES, so she's mostly at NES. Um, we also have a couple of new teachers now. We have two new teachers at the high school, Joanna Spring and Devin. And we have a new teacher at NES, Samantha. And the rest of us have been here. Well, you have been here. I'm new as well. Um, my position's also new. It used to be a 10-month position, and now it's a 12-month position. So in the summer is when um, I work on curriculum and systems and working with our other content um, directors and our principals to think about systems and planning, et cetera. This you won't be able to read because it's so small, but a little bit too much information for you, but I think it's important that we understand what we do in the world of ESL and L's. When we look at English language learners, they get a number. So we know, oh, that student, he's an ELD2. Well, an ELD2 means that that student can produce at the whole text or whole speech level, short phrases, short sentences, formulate grammatical structures at the sentence level, some content words and expressions, and some social and instructional. So that's a kid who's maybe been here a year or less if, if they didn't have prior English. ELD3 is some short and expanded sentences, maybe can write a paragraph or two, not really super well developed with a lot of details, but that's what they can do. The sentence level, mm -hmm. they still have rep repetitive grammar structures, sentence patterns across. So this is how we look at language. When we measure something in the ESL world, a kid's output is not necessarily is the answer 10 or 12. It's how long is the sentence explaining that mathematical kind of reasoning about that. So this is how our, our kids are measured when we look at their data. And when we look at where they are, most important with this is uh, it's not a grade. I'm least interested in grades, although I track data. We have to track data. If my kid is here, I know I want to teach them to get here. So where are those explicit lessons in math for kids to be using increasingly complex sentences to explain their reasoning? Where are those mini lessons about language and science class? And that's what we're constantly trying to do. So it brings us to access. A lot of people have taken a look at, we, at MCAS. I don't know that we've looked at access before. Access is kind of mind-blowing because the kids take four tests. They take listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And any one of those could be in any content area. So it could be a listening about math test. It could be a speaking about science test. For example, this was a three grade three to five span. It's part of their speaking test. There may be eight slides like this. The little computer explains this experiment, kind of goes through what happened on day one, what happened on day two, and now it's day 24. The computer says to the kid, make a hypothesis or a scientific prediction about what you will think will happen to the hot water mixture by day 24. Again, it's not necessarily testing that they get the exact answer of what happens. The test is looking for the kids to use the language of hypothesis or prediction. And do they do it in a sentence? Evaporate. <coughs> I predict it will evaporate. I predict it will evaporate because in the previous slides it showed me. It's looking for how much language and how complex it is. Here's a math example. So we have, um, it's a reading. So it's not like your MCAS reading. It's not about character development or plot. It's can the kids read this chart and answer questions. It's also an elementary sample. So it's a hard test. Um, listening, so this is kind of tricky because the computer will tell them all kinds of information about this and ask them a question. Can you see what the question is to the first item? No. So they're listening for the question that only asks them twice. So it's really, really seeing if the kids are super paying attention and can hear what the question is and then pick the correct answer. And writing. So this was this was a high school writing at the, um, so they, they actually level. So as the kid goes through the test, the items get more and more difficult. If they get the items correct, it will give you more items. So in this one, the student had to write an essay that compares and contrasts your life today with this um, person in this one's life long ago and prior to this prompt there are like eight other slides that will go through where she lived describing what the house looks like what people dress like and then it's looking for the language of comparison and then looking for the vocabulary of things then compared to now so that's what the test looks like 
last year, uh, nationally, a bunch of educators got together with the WIDA people and we were like, you know, uh, ELD5, we're noticing we're exiting kids and they're, they're, we're not getting proficient in, in meeting expectations on a state standards. We don't think five is quite uh, enough academic language to exit them. So we just said, okay, we're gonna make it harder to get a five. So if the scale scored before was maybe like a 400 to a 450 to get a five, now it's a 430 to a 480, for example. So this year, when the state gave us our um, accountability, it actually leveled it for us. So we got new scores. So we need to know as teachers, a 1.8 is actually higher than it was a year ago. So we know that for instruction. Ultimately, I care about data for instruction. It's important because of accountability. It's important to some people for report cards. For me, it's important for how do our teachers teach our kids to make sure that we're teaching them the right stuff to get them ready for college and career readiness to change the world for better. So the state did this, so we, we know what the comparison is. So all of our data has been compared. Um, state of Mass has a great um, data unit. So the feds love what we do. They always make us do stuff because they know Mass will do it well. So how does SE um, determine accountability for L's specifically? So we're included in MCAS data, of course, but we also have our own. We have annual measurable achievement objectives. Our first objective is for our L's to make progress on the, M on the access test one year to another. So the data only includes kids that have two consecutive years worth of data. And the state measures kids um, according to peers. So I'll get into that more. We have a second achievement um, objective, which is do we exit kids? Do they reach that? It used to be five, now it's a 4.2 just for this year. And AMO3 used to be our, our L's getting 75 PPI in the MCAS. We know a lot of our regular ed kids aren't getting 75. And so we've been fighting with the state who's been fighting with the feds over the, this. But in the past, last year, 2016, I think was the first or second year that you made two of those objectives here in Nantucket. So that's commendable. The state hasn't released these yet for this year, but we have our data. So I'm predicting that AMO 1, I think that we will make it because we've increased a little bit from last year. And last year, we were above our target by a couple points. AMO 2, we've increased from last year. So I think, this is my prediction, we don't know, we'll know in a week. AMO 3 has changed, so I'll go into that a little bit more. So 65% of our L's in, in Nantucket made progress. So it's not just they made progress um, by uh, kind of compared to themselves, but also compared to, because we're trying to get them out in six years. So the state will compare two kids from the first year who had the same scaled score, who had been here for the same amount of years, and how much growth did they make and they predict how much growth they have to make to know that you're gonna be on target eventually. So um, our school target scores are 73% at NES, so that was amazing, that's really high. Um, part of it's because of the instruction and the systems that we have in place with our regular teachers and our ESL teachers, who are awesome. Part of it's also because when kids come in in kindergarten, it's a lot easier to make that growth because everyone's kind of learning everything, right? And elementary schools largely focused on literacy, um, very explicit instruction for everything they do, right? Um, our middle school was at 55% and our high school was 62, um, 52%. So that made us a nice average. The state average, the state aim of one making progress, percent of kids making it was 51. So we beat the state this year, so that's good. This is our um, making progress by grade level. So you can see grade one huge. Like I, I definitely, Nicole Ridge is amazing and our kindergarten teachers are amazing, that's for sure. And from kindergarten to first grade, if we have really good instruction, that's how our kids will grow. Not everyone in the state in grade one has a, a 90. Let me tell you, there are schools in the state where kids from kindergarten to first grade make no growth because they don't have ESL teachers. They don't have strong tier one in other classes. So this is still really amazing to look at. So some of our grades do, do better than others. Um, this year, our ESL teachers looked at their kids who made growth last time. So, so when we look at data, we could say, oh, these kids all have an ELD3 level and this is their MCAS scores. That's one way to look at it. Another way to say is these five made progress last year. These four didn't. So I'm gonna have to give them an extra dose because they're not making progress for whatever reason. So it's another way to look at data to improve instruction as opposed to as a score or a grade just to put on the slideshow. 
We also have median SGPA. So usually when we talk about the MCAS, you'll see that there's a point. We, so the high school still has it because they're in the legacy MCAS, but because we've kind of taken away the accountability this year with our MCAS 2.0, this measure doesn't exist. But usually the state says, guess what? If you get a 60 or higher on your median SGPA to give credit to access in your state accountability, we'll give you 25 bonus points to throw into your CPI. Way too much information other than our access count, our access test, if we do 60% of our kids, if our median SGPA is 60, rather, we'll get bonus points. This year that doesn't exist as an accountability. We suspect next year it will. It's just the state kind of took out the accountability from grades three to eight because of the new one guess. So attainment on, on access is how many kids exit out. So 20% um, of our kids in Nantucket had the 4.2 overall and 3.9 literacy eligible to exit. Most of those we did exit. Some of them we kept because they're in third grade and we're like, you know what, let's wait and see what the MCAS looks like. They were right on the cusp and we figure it's better for them to be pulled for ESL or to have some push-in services to really get them over that hump to make sure that, that they get what they need. So AMO3, this is the, the big change this year. We used to have to have L's get this unattainable because if, if they're still learning English, how can we expect that they're going to have this crazy target of 75 PPI? So this year, um, the state, the government, the feds said, okay, Massachusetts, so you're only going to count your fells and your ever L's compared to never L's. So the kids who have exited, how are they doing compared to the mainstream kids who are never um, in ESL services? So that's new. So we think that if, uh, if, if, if I figured out, if I looked at our data the right way, I think that we're going to be okay because mm -hmm. we're just um, two off from um, non-former L's in our ELA. Our, our, that's our former kids who have exited kids. So kids who are out of ESL, and we're actually, um, we beat them in their student growth on math. So we, meaning we, the L's, um, beat regular kids. So L's do make growth, which is important to know. They just need enough time to learn the English and then they need really good tier one instruction in all their content areas, but they do grow. And sometimes they grow at a faster rate than our monolingual students. So here's some MCAS data. So I have the numbers, I will give it to you at the school committee later. We didn't want to have to give you a bunch of numbers up here, so I made a chart instead. So you'll see that um, it's not surprising that kids who are still in English ESL classes are not exceeding in meeting because they're still learning the English to be able to access the test. We have a high number in um, partially meeting. Um, so the kind of difference there is we have more, you know, non-Ls who are in meeting, but in partially meeting, we do have a lot of Ls who are moving toward meeting and exceeding. So the, the goal there, and this is ELA grades three to eight, is to make sure that our tier one content teachers, because those are also our kids who are at ELD three, almost ready to exit, really have solid tier one instruction, which means that they do scaffolds for those L's and really explicitly teach English language as do the ESL teachers in all content areas. <clears throat> Math is similar. So a lot of our L's are in partially meeting. Interesting to note the state. So the guy who's, does, who's in charge of all the accountability and data, Dan Wiener at the state, I asked him, I said, I have a lot of L's who have scores that we could fell who are over here. And we don't know what the MCAS really means because it's a new test, it's new accountability. Should we fail them or should we kind of keep them saying, uh, we don't know. And he actually said, well, a high partially meeting on this year's MCAS would have been a proficient on last year's MCAS. Mm -hmm. Fail them, put them in the mainstream, make sure you give them supports. So once you are exited from ESL, it doesn't mean those supports go away. The teacher still can say, well, I noticed, you know, you're, you're really rocking it in math but your um, writing isn't so great, so I'm still going to give you some targeted, you know, focus and some feedback on your writing about math. So we still give the supports, it's just they don't get pull out ESL. So grade 10 in the high school separated, it's a different test once again. So um, our L's are largely in needs improvement in warning in math. Not surprising, our L's at the high school, um, the ones that I'm most concerned about are the kids who have been here five and six years, and in high school, they might still not be achieving. But most of our high school students have been here three years or, or less. It's a lot harder to learn the academic language of 10th grade math 
than it is to learn the academic language of grade one math. Same with the ELA. That said, um, the way that schooling is set up and the way that teacher college prep classes are set up, when you teach an elementary class, your, your teacher, you know, parents, you know you share ownership of those kids with your teachers, right? During the day, we talk about our kids. And I go out, I'm single, I meet people, I talk about my kids. Eventually, like, how many do you have? And I'm like, oh, I don't have any. I just have, like, right now, I have about 1,600 in Nantucket, 300 L's. But, you know, we, your kids are our kids, right, during the day. So elementary, they own them, they're all day with those teachers. In high school, they see them for just a block, maybe four days a week, right? So that's part of it, too. And there's also that pedagogy in high school is I'm a math content specialist. I don't necessarily teach reading and writing even though the MCAS for math is really a reading and writing test as well as a math content. So there's a little bit of that too. And usually there's a little bit more, it, there's a difference in the way high school embraces an elementary, but it's just part of the pedagogy of owning them all day versus you see them for 45 minutes. Plus you have a million kids when you teach high school. If you teach elementary, you have 20, right? So there's also that piece. That said, um, today the ELA team came down from the high school during my PD with my ESL teachers. I sent them on a walk to go visit each other's classrooms to look for best practices of what we have in our rooms. And um, we sat with the high school ELA team and they said, Kelly, we're so glad you're here. You know, what should we do about our assessments? How can we better teach our English language learners in our core content ELA classes? So that's huge. So we talked about the assessments, their books, we thought about some plans. So I feel like Nantucket has everything in place for our kids to continue to achieve and do better on all of their assessments. We have everything we need here. So we have our science, high school as well. So that's another area we, we also are knowing that science, they, they have it sixth through eight and then they have it in ninth grade, but in elementary they don't. So we, we know language of science is something we need to look at. The NGSS explicitly teaches about reading, writing, speaking, and listening in science. So that's just some work we have to do bridging SEI. So I'm gonna show you a video. Sorry, but I think it'll be worth it. I think you're gonna love the video. So what is next gen, let me just, what is next gen ESL? So with our ESL team, we are working on, on revamping our curriculum. So it's aligned to the standards, it's aligned to the practices, and it's focused on focused language goals. This is a high school ESL class. This is what we do. Oh no. My name's Martha Boisel. Oh. I'm teaching here at Brighton High School for Why didn't it show? Years. And Hold I'm on. an ESL 3 Escape teacher that. and ESL 1 teacher. I'm Escape that, maybe. Teacher here. Who wants to read the language objective? Jeff. Students will be able to explain their evaluation of bias yeah. resources using signal words of fact and opinion. Today's lesson in the entire unit is based on women's rights. The language objective was for students to be able to evaluate um, a source and pick out the signal words for bias using opinion signal words like I pronouns and also for facts being able to pick out words like study show um, and different percentages. What evidence do we have? You could pay the same woman for the same job, right? That's a good one to put down. I learned how women are not considered equal as men even though they would do the same hard work and if we look at the world today, women are participating more compared to men. So, and they're still, if they have the same job, they would be, they would be paid less compared to men. So that's kind of a big, I think that's discrimination for women because that's not right. The class is made up of 10th graders all the way to 12th graders, and we have students from all over the world in that class. And they really do learn a lot from each other and can use each other for support. We would talk uh, as a group. We would uh, do conversations. She would ask our opinions. We definitely have a few different proficiency levels. We also have students that are former SLIFE students. So, you know, I take all of those things into consideration when I'm grouping the students and when I'm choosing the work to do for the day. All of the MCUs that we've done all have a social justice lens. 
so that students are really taking away critical thinking skills and they can feel empowered. Because they're selling beauty that's not real. Because they're selling beauty that's not real. That's a really good The unit for me personally really changed how I teach. And so what is this commercial flying to do? It's almost like a transformation. Like being a, being a part of this has just given me so much knowledge on how to be an effective ESL teacher. Because when you're an ESL teacher, you have state standards, you have uh, access in WIDA, and you also have the Common Core, and you have um, you know people questioning. Do you have to give them content knowledge? And so. By really evaluating the state's new definition of ESL instruction and creating the focused language goals and using the Wigan backward design, we really can make a very explicit unit that continuously is teaching the language throughout the unit. So you think they're trying to use those? So I'll pause there. I could show you videos of teaching and learning all day. But that's what we do. So it's not three blue pencils, four blue pencils, over, under. It's, it's we, we, we use some content, and our focus is for kids to be making meaning and to be able to make meaning in increasingly complex ways. So, so that's what we do. So we are standards-based. So when the high school team asked me, um, you know, how are we going to do this? I said, well, what standards are you working on right now? And they said, oh, well, we're working on, our question is, how does a character from... Um, Lord of the Flies uh, changed from the beginning to the end, and I said, that's great. I said, because the high school ELD three teachers, so the kids are in both of those classes, is actually working on um, how do characters interact with each other and their interactions propel the plot. So that's a high school ELA standard. So we, we hinge our meaning there, and then we really drive home our focus language goal was retelling, so being able to summarize, retell, sequence, and cite evidence from text. So for English language learners, because the teacher's like, they can't quote. And I'm like, because probably no one's taught them how to quote. But if you literally explicitly teach them, there's some words from the text. You can't take them and put them in your essay unless you put quotes around them. And if you do that, you need to introduce it with a phrase like, in the text it says, or the author shows, or whatever. So then once you teach them that, they of course can do that. We just need to teach them that explicit way of doing that. So that's why our, our ESL teachers are very, very, very busy, as are our SEI teachers, which are all of our content teachers. So we're almost done, bear with me. So our next steps. So in ESL, we have benchmarks. So this year, at the beginning of the year, all the teachers gave a writing prompt. I said, they're not gonna do that well, but that's okay. And for you guys with your goals, it's actually good. It's like, like it's easier to lose 50 pounds than it is to lose those last five, right? So it's okay, let's give it to them. And then we all looked and we're like, wow, like there was very little evidence of how to indent a paragraph, very little evidence of how to cite evidence from text, even though prompt said cite evidence from this text. So already, you know, I met with them today. They're like, wow, look, they're citing evidence from text with like nice little subordinate clauses that introduce it. So that's huge. We're working on our next generation ESL unit development and, mm -hmm. and we're working on lesson strategies because we can't just build our own unit overviews. I'm most interested in what's going on today and tomorrow in the classroom. So we're trying to do those two things in tandem. We also have ESL pushing into math classes and um, through the elementary schools and um, co-teaching at CPS. So that's new that this year. So that's been wonderful that um, that the principals have, have welcomed me in and said, how can we do what's best for our kids? So we're trying that out. It means we're supporting our teachers because of kids, of course, elves need to be able to language about math. It's just as important as languaging about ELA stuff. Um, we have a new text resource at CPS this year. It's not it's not the curriculum. It's a resource that we can build our units. So the teachers also working with what how do we pick and choose which resources we like. Over the summer, we'll, we'll build our own units as well. Um, SEI steps. So we have Retail 1 will be happening again for new staff. We have STEM um, SEI 2. We're going to focus on STEM, so math and science key uses. That will be coming in the winter or spring and then best practices. So CPS, I think I've been twice now and we've done walkthroughs far more times. We have a walkthrough tomorrow morning. Um, it's been great working with their staff. They're really lovely. Um, so what, we kind of do walkthroughs and then I go and, and we've decided to focus on academic conversation, academic discourse. It's part of engagement. How are kids having meaningful conversations, deep conversations? So really working with the staff on that. Um, next Monday, I'm doing my first walkthrough at the high school. 
and um, at the elementary schools, um, we're doing. We've done two faculty meetings at NIS and two at and both both of them, and we've looked at data, and then continuing with um, walkthroughs, getting those on the schedule. This is the not as much fun stuff. Well, parent outreach definitely fun. It's the coordinated program review. Let me take that back. Parent outreach working on that. Um, one thing you may have heard of brouhaha. Um, so. So coordinated program review is state and federal policies that we have to um, follow and the state looks at our programs every six years and Office of Civil Rights is also involved. So for our parent conferences tomorrow, we used to use student translators, which was a great idea for our students to get community credit, service credit, but state and federal guidance says that school districts have to provide um, volunteers that are adults because of confidentiality. So that's an example of one of the systems things that we kind of had to change, and it, it wasn't easy to do, and it was last minute, kind of feels bad, changes messy, but it's really making sure that we're, we're in guidance with our state and federal regulations. So I'll be working on that this year because they're coming next year. So I have to do a self-assessment assessment of programs, and we have to make sure that we are either in alignment with that guidance or making steps to, to increase and to improve. Then also working on parent outreach, trying to think outside of the box. So maybe if parents coming at five at night doesn't work, so maybe thinking what other times might we do it? Might we do parent outreach on Saturday mornings and provide childcare? So thinking outside of the box if we really want our parents to come into our school. Questions and answers. Why don't we ask the school committee team to have that Come back. questions from there? Thank you, Kelly. Kelly, do you want to take a seat over here to answer the questions? hot seat? Oh, the seat. <laughs> Peter, do you need this still? Okay. That was a really fantastic presentation, Kelly. Thank you. Oh, thank Very you. thorough and um, absolutely. So um, I'll look to my right. Any questions yeah. or comments? No, I just like the energy I'm saying. Oh, thank you. That I do have. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a couple of questions and, and comments. On your seventh slide, which showed the first language not First language, not English, and then the English learning. You had 28% there, and then the other was 16%. Mm -hmm. Just for my clarity, if I think the term is flapped, if the English learner becomes proficient, right, would they then be added still, into first language? First language, not English. Not English. Yes. So that would that in, would that. increase and then decrease the other one. Mm -hmm. So okay. Mm -hmm. So the overall percentage of students that we have in the school currently who English is not the first language and could be also involved is the combination of the 28.6 and the 16.10. Yes, and okay. it's a little higher than that because they captured that from last March 1st. Gotcha. Um, what, are the, what are the possibilities of the state requiring ELs to not have the option of opting out? I mean, I, that's just that it's a sort of federal surprised guidance. me. So it comes from the federal government, so they have to. And I think it's probably because historically, um, so we've done a much better job in the past 10 years and 15 years with our ESL programs. But historically, and it's still in some places in the country, the programs are really subpar. And so parents will say, I don't want my kid pulled out. Literally, in Boston, we had classrooms under the stairs, in the closet. So, so parents have the right to say they want to opt out of that program. Yeah. Ideally, as we grow the program and as we share the successes of our wonderful ESL team and our wonderful SEI practices and core content, um, parents will say, hmm, I don't think I want them to opt out, but maybe we, can we look at the types of services? So maybe um, we'll, we'll do push-in or, or, or they'll hear, wow, the kids in ESL are doing really close to or meeting expectations on MCAS or growing this much faster. So that's the real hope is that people understand um, that it's actually advantageous yeah. for our kids to be in the ESL classrooms. Yeah. And I, I, I'm impressed with the comprehensive presentation and the work that you're all doing. Um, I can't help but think that, not to give more work, but I think our, our English learners, uh, English speaking students. I, I know we have support classes for them, but I, I wonder if in the future we'll ever see a combination of these students being put together because the breakdown 
and the continuity and the instruction on how to understand sentence structure and, and vocabulary. There are a lot of students who let English as the first language could benefit from sitting in classes with that, and I just wonder if that would be a wonderful... I think what will happen, so we joked about this today, so usually in the field of applied linguistics, we do things and then other people kind of go, oh, so I'm guessing that when these ESL units go out and critical stance is just out there on the table, like, what's the real reason for learning this? Not just to pass the MCAS, we want them to have those skills for college and career readiness, but part of our units is we want them to think about the world and how they interact with the world and how they um, can be an age, have agency. Mm -hmm. So that part we suspect will, will take off. And then also all of the core content areas have language practices and that's new in the Common Core. Most um, school districts and educators are still just looking at just the standards, but looking at the practices is key. So I know that at CPS, they're looking at the math practices. When I work with the ESL teachers who are pushing in, then they're focusing on the math practices because that's the key. So how are we making sense of the problem and persevering and solving them? Mm -hmm. So in ESL, we, we, we hinge on that because that's where we get the buy-in, like this is how you language about math. It's not just words, right? Mm -hmm. It's about sentences and those connecting and the, the big picture mm -hmm. explaining yourselves. So I, I suspect that as people learn more about that, then they will indeed, because even science has the literacy goals, the literacy standards. Yeah. Reading informational text is in the science frameworks. Yeah, no, it's very impressed with the instruction. So thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thank you. I loved your presentation. Thank and you. I'm going to echo what they've said. Your enthusiasm is just incredible. So thank you. And I want to thank all of the teaching staff who are with these students day in and day out. And I'm sure it's so much more than what we even see. There's the social and emotional aspect that you guys work with and gaining their trust. And I applaud you all and thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Zola? No, ditto for me. <laughs> no sense in repeating it, but um, I think it's, it's something that we are working very hard on. You guys are putting and a lot of effort and it, it's going it shows and it's going to continue to show and I think uh, with Kelly here on board you have uh, a lot of strength thank you so I, I, honestly I'm I, now I'm really not a touchy-feely person I could be me in another district where people wouldn't embrace embrace change so when I honest it's really I because I'm not touchy-feely naturally it's really because everyone is so welcoming them welcoming and wanting to change and or had things in place already and they're like Kelly let's just plug you in here so that's really what makes it possible is like that kind of spirit here Natalie, do you have a question you're the toughest one what do you got for me <laughs> no, no. high school kids no I think it's awesome I'm not you know in a lot of classes with a lot of these kids so it's cool to see what they're doing um, I think in the end they're gonna be you know a lot better off than the rest of us because they'll know two languages we used to only know one so you know what do you take the foreign language? I do. What do you study? I take Spanish. Oh, fabulous. And I can't say that I'm very good at it, but... <laughs> study abroad is the best thing you can ever do oh, in college. Oh, I, yes. I went to Barcelona last year. It was amazing. So. Would, would you want to take the MCAS in Spanish? Me? I just I just have to ask that because every time yeah. that, I, that I look at this, um, I think about the challenges and, and many of us have some world language experience, um, but to come here or to go to France and take um, an exam the first year that I'm there or the second year that, that I'm there or the third year to take a science oh. exam in French mm -hmm. in the fifth or sixth year gives you an idea of the daunting task that we challenge um, our children with mm -hmm. so um, and I, I you know you, you said it at one point Kelly um, for our children who are English learners it's time and the system doesn't always give them time um, and it's unfortunate because um, given time we have shown um, that our children um, can graduate from Nantucket High School bilingual, as Natalie points out, um, and ready to tackle anything, career or, or college. Um, 
but it is it's challenging when you throw a first year English learner into the tenth grade and say, oh, by the way, here's biology. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, that's where the state and federal systems don't always work to the um, to the students' best interests. Mm -hmm. So, uh, great, great job, Kelly. Yeah, thank you. And thank you can you. see why um, the emphasis in all of the school improvement plans was um, the the walkthroughs with Kelly and the walkthroughs with Michelle um, are, and the time that they have at faculty meetings this year. You know, that is very purposeful and, and important if we're going to move the needle for these disaggregated groups. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it is. It already is, and it's going to get even better. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Peter. Shall we, shall we move back to our sure, yeah. front row seats? Right. Thank you. That's, we're getting our steps yeah. in. I'm going to hear about this agenda. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, who's going to be Yeah, I think it is. So, I'm going to school year. Oh my god. Just just nice elbow there. He's getting close to my bed. All right, uh, so um, Michael Horton, our director of uh, curriculum for STEM, has given you um, parts one and two of, of a three-part um, series of presentations in, on mathematics, the third and final part. Um, I have the privilege of presenting to you um, some of the adjustments that we're making in mathematics at CPS. Um, and so what I'll outline here are those adjustments um, to, to help math instruction for all students, um, including those at, at opposite ends of the, of, the, of the spectrum, struggling math learners, as well as our um, high achieving math students. So uh, the, the problem that we're trying to tackle is that our scores have been uh, pretty flat for a, a few years now with, in terms of, of math achievement. So you'll recall that um, because of that, we formed a math task force a few years ago. Um, out of that math task force came a number of recommendations. Um, we worked with some consultants, um, and we put in place uh, some different things to try to uh, ch change the, the flat results. Um, and so over the past uh, three years, uh, we had what, what we kind of termed a double dose of math in the sixth grade, where we had two math teachers. They divided the math standards. Um, so one of the math teachers in sixth grade took half of the math standards. The other sixth grade math teacher took the other half. And so it was more time on math, and we thought that that would translate into improved scores. Um, quite frankly, it didn't, and the scores remained flat. Um, so... Uh, what we've done this year is gone back to just a, a single math teacher in uh, sixth grade, um, but we've changed the model for math intervention, which I'll explain in, in a second. Uh, we've increased the emphasis on literacy because that uh, you know, skills in literacy have an impact on the math scores. Um, so there's um, additional time on literacy in sixth grade. Um, and we've added some support for our L's uh, to be able to help that group um, continue to, to grow and achieve in the area of math. So let me start with intervention, then I'll talk about um, acceleration. So, um, so a couple years ago, we created the math intervention uh, position. Uh, we had some some challenges with the staffing of that position. Um, we then uh, were able to improve this, the staffing, but it was a pull-out model of support. So students had their regular math class, and then they had a second math class that, that was uh, more remedial in nature, um, but it was kind of trying to backfill some of the gaps that the data was indicating existed in isolation from their, their math class. Um, and so this year we've sw switched it to a push-in model of intervention. So the math interventionist 
goes into the math class. And so you've got two math teachers in the math classroom in sixth grade and in seventh grade. And so they have the ability to, um, in real time, address the needs of students. So they know exactly what's happening in the math class and can support that instead of just in isolation supporting skills in general. Um, they're specifically addressing um, the uh, um, concepts that are being taught in the math class. Additionally, we have created um, an ESL class for the language of math, and so Kelly talked a little bit about this. And so we've got this uh, for, for all three grade levels. Um, so the way that, what that looks like is you've got um, uh, some of our uh, lower um, level uh, English learners, level, level one and level two um, English learners, uh, that are in a math class with their peers, with the push-in math support, uh, and so that interventionist then is with the ESL teacher and another block in the day where they're teaching the language of math so that they can then go back to that math class and have more success. Um, and we expect um, that that's going to pay um, dividends in terms of, of some of our results. Now, we also want to make sure, and this is what I, I, I didn't want to talk too much about, uh, about in the improvement plan uh, presentation because it would then be redundant here. We've also addressed the um, upper level math students. And so what we've tried to create, you've seen in, in past presentations from uh, Michael Horton, some of the pathways um, and those, you'll recall some of the slides that he's shown that uh, show the different pathways for acceleration. So what we've tried to create at the middle school is multiple pathways for um, acceleration um, and multiple entry points. So. In the past, we've had an advanced math class in eighth grade only. And so for a while, that was one class that, the, that students were identified for, and you had, uh, the teacher had to teach all the eighth grade math standards plus the Algebra One standards, and all condensed into one course, um, uh, which we feel is not the most effective model. So what we created um, uh, last year was a way for students to take an eighth grade math class and uh, double up with an Algebra one class during the Encore block. Um, but this year, um, we've created many pathways to that, and we expect that the results will be, hopefully, that we can create more than just a, a single section of uh, that upper level by the time they get to, to eighth grade. But what we've done is, is there's an accelerated math class in sixth grade, an accelerated math class in seventh grade, um, and the eighth grade Algebra one course still exists. Now, to identify kids for these accelerated uh, math classes, we are constantly um, looking at data and um, moving students into the class as they are eligible, as they are demonstrating their ability to be able to work at a, at a more rapid pace and be ready to, for the next level. So we reached out to fifth grade teachers in the spring and we said um, that we wanted them to identify who would be the students that uh, look at look at their data and who would be the students that would be um, uh, uh, ready for an accelerated math class in sixth grade. So we started the year with, with that group, but then uh, soon after students get to CPS, we start map testing. And so then we had additional data points. Then we got MCAS results. So we had the fifth grade recommendations plus map data from, the, uh, from September plus the MCAS results. And so what that exposed was that there were some additional kids that weren't initially identified for the accelerated math class that we, th we felt were ready for that. And so because the first few weeks of school was um, all classes in sixth grade were kind of covering the same concepts and, and kind of getting back into the routines of the math class, the acceleration point had, had yet to begin. It's now begun and we've moved additional kids into that class. And so that's an example of us constantly looking at the data to really know our students and push kids in. We had another example of a seventh grade student um, who was in a standard math class in seventh grade and uh, she um, advocated for herself. She actually approached um, her seventh grade math teacher and her guidance counselor and uh, me and said and, and uh, the assistant principal and said um, I think I, I, I think I can be in that accelerated class. I'd like to be in that. Can, can we um, is there a way that I can get into that class? So we revisited the extra data that we had for her, and sure enough, the data panned out. And so we're, we're constantly looking at ways for kids to be able to get in there. Now, if you're not, if you don't make it into that sixth grade class, does that mean that that's it for you? You're never gonna be on the accelerated track? 
Absolutely not, because again, we'll, we'll continue to gather data and be able to have kids enter it now. It's unlikely once we get to a certain point in the year that a, a, a additional sixth graders will be moved in like after the halfway point of the year, but after, um, uh, but it's possible, but it's more likely that they finish the year in whatever class they're in now, and then we'll revisit the data. And if you weren't in sixth grade, but now the data indicates that you've done really well, you can uh, accelerate into the seventh grade accelerate uh, seventh grade accelerated math class, and the same thing for eighth. So um, we like uh, what this the potential for this model on both ends um, of the spectrum because we feel like we're doing a better job now of meeting the needs of kids that are struggling, but also providing additional opportunities for kids to excel accelerate. And really knowing the data has helped us identify who those kids are. Now, um, I said that the scores were flat, so. Uh, we've talked a lot about how MCAS is, uh, it's a new test, a new baseline. The state has said to us, don't try to compare it to Park. Well, we didn't really listen. So we wanted to just see, because it's interesting data, um, what were, how were the kids performing on Park in 2016, and how are they now performing um, on the MCAS? And so what you'll, you'll see is that um, this, this um, kind of solidifies our, our um, uh, theory that, in fact, the scores are flat. Um, and so you'll see it's color-coded. So uh, r red is, is formally in park cup level one or level two. And in uh, an MCAS, it's the not meeting expectations. Kids that were red are still red or possibly now yellow. Um, kids that are green is uh, before level four are now meeting expectations. And so it's, it's they're flat results. And so... Um, this is just a small uh, snapshot of the chart that, that uh, Mike was describing before. This, this spreadsheet is much bigger in that it includes not only PARC and MCAS, but it includes MAP data and the grades that they're getting in, in their classes and, so, um, and some additional uh, data points as well. And so um, in the workshop in a couple of weeks, we can, we can share with you the, the full spreadsheet. Um, now, one of the questions that has been raised about uh, some students uh, have been in our pilot uh, project-based learning class and so the question was are there any differences in in scores um, from kids that were in the project-based class versus other kids and so this is um, not not the best graph but, but but basically it's it's what it shows is that uh, our kids were either meeting expectations on MCAS or partially meeting expectations the cutoff for meeting expectations is 500 and you see that the kids are are close to that mark in the 480s and 490s these are all kids that were in PBL if I showed you a, a similar random snapshot from any other group of kids not in PBL it would look exactly like this so um, we've seen that there's there's really no difference in whether they were in uh, a traditional math setting or a project-based learning setting um, which is great news for us and it's what we predicted um, that even doing some kind of alternative uh, uh, methods and strategies in a classroom doesn't impact um, doesn't have a great impact one way or the other on uh, scores. So the likely results of all of this is that, again, we're going to be able to see some gains in student achievement. Students who struggle are going to have more support and more targeted support. Um, um, I really love what I'm seeing so far in the, in the ESL for the language of math class um, in, in uh, each of the grade levels. Um, and there's more opportunities for kids at the upper levels to have their needs met at uh, an earlier um, an earlier grade than just waiting till um, eighth grade or, or even waiting till high school. So what you've got here is just again a summary. Um, we started back in 2013 with that task force, and now uh, over the years we've continued to to examine the data, um, make some adjustments, and we feel like we've got an even stronger model now that um, meets the needs of kids on, on both ends of the spectrum. So to do this work, this is not the work of me, this is the work of our team, which includes um, at the middle school, five teachers, so our math interventionists, our licensed math teachers. So we've got a team of, of five um, highly qualified educators uh, to be able to, to do this work and they've really put a tremendous amount of effort into the curriculum development uh, process in each of the three grade levels. So that is a math presentation. Come back to the hot seat. All right, great. <laughs> it was great. Love Thank the you, hot Peter. Hot seat. <laughs> Thank you.
Great, thank you, Peter. That was a really nice review of where we've been. I'll start at the end of the table and work down. So, Tim, do you have any comments or questions? Thank you. Okay. We have to think of different ways to improve. <laughs> I agree. No, no comments. <laughs> Ditto. I really like the format that you have now, the structure. I think. Uh, fingers crossed, but I think this is really a positive way, a good step forward, and I really think you'll see good progress with this. One quick question. Eighth grade math, you don't have an interventionist? There isn't currently an interventionist. The The thought behind that is if we do our job well, like there'd be less of a, a need for that model, but the seventh grade schedule and eighth grade schedule are in sync, so if we wanted to make some kind of adjustment that way, it's possible in the scheduling process. Thank you. Uh -huh. Nothing. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite, and I think it's gonna work. Mm. Yeah. Okay, Natalie? Uh, I like the interest thing. Two teachers is better than one. That's gotta be good. Um, my question is about PBL, so is that still, I mean, I'm not familiar with PBL, that's where I'm at, but is that <laughs> still something students take? Uh, yes, yeah, so so project-based learning uh, was piloted last year by two of our teachers, mm -hmm. um, and so it it takes uh, for for a group of students in instead of their traditional seventh grade English class, uh, or uh, instead of their traditional eighth grade math class. So it's two groups of, of students. Uh, they work on a, on a project. So you'll you'll hear more about. Uh, the specifics of that project as it goes. This, this year, uh, the first project they're working on is uh, um, building uh, little libraries, which is really exciting. It involves all sorts of um, uh, STEM and uh, literacy skills. Um, and so it's just a uh, non-traditional way of approaching the same standard. So they're still learning the, still learning the math. If you're in seventh grade, you kind of get a little preview of some of the eighth grade math standards. So it's even though it's not an accelerated math class by being in PBL, um, you do get exposure to uh, um, eighth grade math while you're a seventh grader. So it, it, it's got some accelerated math flavoring to it. Um, and in eighth grade, it, it does take the place of your math class. But again, the results are uh, mm -hmm. have been the same. So it, it replaces it. It's not in addition. Correct. And it's both English and math. So it's, is that like splitting your math and your English time in one class? No. So if you are in seventh grade and you're in the PBL class for English, you still have another math class. Oh, okay. If you're in eighth grade, you still have another English class. Okay. It's confusing. It is confusing. <laughs> did, did, no, go ahead. Okay. I just, I, I wanted to um, tack onto the comments. I, I think probably the most important slide of all of this is number of, um, on the bottom of page four where we see um, the really um, sincere um, efforts and innovation that have gone into a lot of different um, solutions to try to get our students to, um, uh, again, not test well, but understand math better. Um, and I think um, I agree with Jen. I think this is a really great solution. I'm excited to see how what the results are, but I am also uh, stand at the ready and know that um, if they're not um, exactly where we want to be, we'll think about it again and keep making it better. So thank you for that. Anybody else? I'm going to jump in. Yes. I, I, I just would echo that. I, I think, you know, if you're playing any sport and you're not winning, um, you, you change. You try something else. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that's what we do in education. Um, I really um, like this change because it's not just about changing the remediation model. It's also changing the model for those different accelerated points for kids to go forward. Um, and that was always tough to wait until eighth grade. Um, 
and now I, I just I think it's really exciting and um, you know we've added intervention teachers over this time um, period and um, so I, I think it's an exciting model and and I appreciate that uh, that Peter and the team keep trying some some different things I agree. so um, it's good stuff thank you Peter Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks, thanks Michael for the Horton. Hot seat not being so hot this time. <laughs> <laughs> There's always another time. Yeah. <laughs> Just you wait. Don't get too comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Horton will give us our homeschool report, of which there seem to be few, but we'll see. So um, I think this might be the first time in my career that I have the shortest presentation. <laughs> um, so I'll try to keep this uh, short, short and sweet. Uh, on the vertical axis, you have the number of students. Okay. Um, so across the uh, horizontal <laughs> axis, you have the uh, years, the school years, and then which grade levels those students are in when they're submitted uh, homeschool plans uh, to the central office. So in 15, 16, you can see there was two first graders, a fourth grader, an eighth grader, 10th grader, 11th grader. So there were six students. Last year, we had four uh, students uh, being homeschooled. And this year, um, interesting enough, um, it's down to two. And there's a couple things that um, are happening. Uh, one is when I reached out to the families um, late September, when I said, hey, I noticed um, that your student is not enrolled at the public school or you're still on island, you know, you haven't submitted a, a homeschool plan, um, what's up? And uh, first answer was, uh, well, we decided to stay off island. So there are a few families who had been homeschooling their students in the past um, who, you know, would, would have properties, you know, off island and would go there for the summer um, and rent their homes here um, during the summer months. Uh, for whatever reason, they decided to stay and continue renting their homes year round and they stayed in New Hampshire, Maine, um, other parts of New England. And a second thing, which was new to me, and you may have seen these commercials on television, is that there are now um, public online high schools. Um, which, which is uh, actually public online schools, I should say. Um, fascinating. Um, it's uh, concept uh, development and uh, TECA, uh, T E C A, T E C C A. Um, families are opting to withdraw their students, um, not homeschool them, but uh, enroll them in a public online, online school. Um, th they're free and recognized by the state as an, an accredited um, school. Um, they have to go through a variety of different things to become accredited. Uh, and this is kind of new territory for us. Uh, so there's a handful of students who don't qualify as homeschool, but they're also not enrolled in our public school, but they are here on, on island. That's my report. Mike, how do you know the number of kids? Because that that that's a, good question. that's a very moving number. I'm, I don't believe that there are that few. I, I agree, and, and I would say that you know my um, math brain and you know craving for patterns would know of our population on the island, of our growing population. How can there only be two? Um, and the reality is, I don't know. Okay, but the reality is, I'm not canvassing neighborhoods, knocking on doors, looking for children. Um, most likely, though, uh, I hear about it one way or another. I'm tipped off from, from a parent of another student who has a play group and says, hey, you know, I'm noticing this student isn't attending school. You know, you know what's going on. I have to be careful with confidentiality there. Um, guidance counselors are very helpful. Um, in this situation, where I notice the numbers are really down, I just I made a few phone calls. And the parents would share, oh, I, I enrolled my child in the online um, public school. Or, you know, we decide not to come back to the island th this year. Um, so, you know, we would, we would work with a school resource officer in terms of truancy and those types of issues. But it's not something that we're actively pursuing. Um, I think on Nantucket, it is a small island for the most part. You know, students have been homeschooled in the past. 
Um, we've known, you know, from the beginning, you know, from preschool on up that they decided to go that route opposed to enrolling in the public school. Um, so we know some of those common names. That's where my starting point was to make a few calls. But, you know, there, there, there are probably some students, you know, in, in neighborhoods on the islands, uh, you know, and the parents have decided not to or don't know to, um, you know, submit a plan. Um, it is on the parent to, to submit a plan. Um, it's not on us. It is a parent responsibility. Um, and that really is to have some background information um, with the most likely ca case of a student eventually tran trans transitioning into the public school, which typically happens in high school. Um, students um, who might have been homeschooled for elementary school um, or, or more likely to transition to high school um, for you know, access to um, participation in clubs and sports and want to be part of a graduating class, earn a diploma, et cetera, et cetera. So if we have some information of what they've been studying and what their curriculum plans have been, it helps with that transition process to place, okay, um, is a 16-year-old ready for junior year or are they, or are they probably looking at uh, sophomore year? Obviously, we use a lot of different uh, measures to determine placement, um, but that's why we keep homeschool plans on, on file. Have you had that happen before? So one that you, that was under the radar, and then all of a sudden they come to high school and you've never had a, a homeschool plan filed before? I, I haven't yet. I don't know if Dr. Bucky could, could speak to that or, or, or Jen Sardellis as a, as a guidance counselor. Um, typically we know and hear and make some phone calls to parents. You know, unless a student is completely isolated, which is a whole other set of concerns, um, we, we find out because we are a small community and people hang out together and shop together and have a events together and birthday parties together so uh, Dr. Bucky, Jen, has that ever happened? If students are enrolled in the school system and then withdraw, that's when we can catch them best because we need to know where they're going. Right. And some, some will say enrolling to grants and some say um, homeschool student in which case we'll walk them through the homeschooling process of what they need to do. Where it gets tricky is when students move to Nantucket and they're not on our radar and we don't know that they're here. So then we're not really sure um, who to look for. Okay. Or if a student withdraws and says they're going to some private school up island or moving somewhere and then they don't or they move back and we're not notified, that's when kids fall through the cracks. So so I think every, all the administrators here are uh, 10 years and less. Uh, so my question is, and maybe it's for the school committee members that have been here a while, have we ever had an incident that we're aware of that I mentioned? Well, I think, I think that there have been cases of homeschooling being no schooling, right. uh, which is unfortunate in that can be aggravation with the, the school system. And I also think that there is a hidden population out there of people that are homeschooling or no schooling uh, and perhaps will surface when they want to play football, hopefully. Right. <laughs> uh, but I think it's, it's tricky because you could probably go back and look at birth certificates and that would give you some information, but the other way is through the, uh, the, the other way, those people are just hidden out there. Right. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of the data project that's going on, to actually trying to get yeah. a, a solid number of the, of the year-round population and how it fluctuates a little bit. I can definitely tell you I've had experiences where there are gaps in, in, in student schooling. Um, students who are transient, you know, with the uh, um, tourism industry who are here for the summer and stick around for a month or so but don't enroll in school and then take off and by the time we try to catch up with them, they've moved back to another state or, not, or another yeah. country, you know, and, and they were, they had a month or so gap. Mike, did you want to jump in? I would just, I don't want to belabor um, the point, but it, it's, it would be very hard and I don't think any educator would say, absolutely do we have 
um, everybody accounted for. As Jen said, you, you wouldn't know. I have, um, the only other thing I'd like to say is that um, while I have seen some very bad homeschooling or no mm. homeschooling, I've also seen some very good homeschooling. No. And just, you know, um, it gets increasingly more difficult for parents as the child gets older and gets into, you know, biology, mm. chemistry, um, calculus, some of those things. Um, is, so it's, it's more often that they will come back in or go to a, a virtual school. So I don't want to. I, I just do want to ask that if there is a way, perhaps through the withdrawals, that we can track how many to attend an online program. Yep. I think that would be an interesting statistic for us to start following because I think it's going to be an increasing trend. Um, and um, I think it's just one worth starting to gather some information. The, the, the challenge there is that they don't have to tell us. Hmm. Just as hmm. they don't have to tell us that they're going to private school. And in fact, sometimes the private schools won't tell us. Right, but if we mm. can, um, if so, we ask and they give us the answer, I'd like to right. start talking. Sure, yeah, sure. You know, but, just yeah. But how are you going to gauge whether or not it has been satisfactory? Uh, you're because not. Because I can but tell you, I'm just, going to a, a, you're not. a public online school, and I just sit right. home and you're not. Smoke. You're, you're not know. unless you try but to come back if in. If the state accredits the yeah. school, we have to trust like, that the state's doing their job. So. I, you know, I, I don't think it's about the quality. I, I think for us, it's just about seeing the, the numbers yeah. and the trends like I'm, we I'm did. Tracking I'm tracking it. I have four students I know of right now that are enrolled at Connections Academy, mm -hmm. right, which is the online public school. Yeah. So I, so really, this number it could be six. They just those other four don't count. Don't count because they're in a, because this is a new thing. School. It is a online public school. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Let's let's get you out of here before you. Yep. Lose your prize for shortest presentation yeah. ever. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. you. Say that okay. Bucky. Let's go through these votes. Um, may I please have a motion to approve donations to the NHS Landscaping and Garden Program? I'm going to read four of them, and if we could approve them in bulk, is that okay, Logan? So the first for Plumber's Supply Company, $191.18. Second, Surfing Hydrangea for $664. Third, for Island Lumber Company, $63.75. And fourth, for Marine Home Center for $250.28. May I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. May I please have a motion to approve the district calendar for the 2018-2019 school year? So moved. Second. Uh, before we do? Yes. June. I, I'm confused by the blurb. Is that uh, going on? Th th that was just a um, a copy of a, a so it includes copy the 24th problem. through the there, you have to have five days. Okay. So it goes um, five days after your last day of school. It's a Sorry, storm. that's okay. No. So there's a motion and a second. Yeah, I didn't notice that. Um, all uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Du duly noted that that was only draft two that we just approved. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We're getting better. <laughs> we are getting better. Thank you. Um, may I please have a motion to approve the transfers and invoices in the amount? Uh, so yeah, thank you. Oh, we did in two minutes. I checked it off, but I had them after. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Motion to approve the minutes for October 24th, 2017. Second? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. And may I have a motion to approve the transfers and invoices? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Superintendent's report. Mm, very um, quickly, the enrollment is there. Um, 1629 up to students from the previous. Um, and... Um, you have the entries and withdrawals, um, so you get an idea of the activity. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, pretty pretty consistent with what we've seen. It is. It's, um, it's just interesting to see the numbers continually trickle up. Yeah. Five, five withdrawals, though. And five entries at the high school. So, I'm just curious. About, do we know any information about the withdrawals? In some cases, um, and I, I don't know if Jen or John want to talk about the the five withdrawals um or the four at nes kim 
Thousand. Thousand. John, anything? Okay. And then on the horizon, um, I think you have to determine, uh, we had talked about having a workshop for the next meeting. Um, I put a question mark 430 on the 21st. Mm -hmm. And um, but that's that's up to you. We really were going to talk about just the, the MCAS piece, mm -hmm. but I think that um, Martin will also have a preliminary budget roll forward okay. for you. Um, so I think you'd want to confirm that time, and then if you could have an executive, a short executive session at the end of that meeting, um, that would be great. So what's the pleasure of the committee? Is 4.30 on the 21st um, feel okay to do a, a workshop and then stay for a, an executive session at 6 o'clock? It's a Tuesday, right? It is Tuesday. It's before the Thanksgiving holiday. I'm just looking. I don't have my calendar. Okay. 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 Yeah, it's the normal two, second, uh, third oh, Tuesday. Right. It's just earlier. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just earlier. Mm -hmm. Which is the 21st. And that's all I have. Wonderful. Looks like it would work. Okay. Mm. Tim? I'm not. Okay. Great. Jenny, are you all? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Why don't we go ahead and confirm that? Okay. Um, subcommittee work group um, liaison reports. Policy tomorrow morning. Yes, we'll be back here tomorrow at 8. <laughs> Yes. You got a short sleep. <laughs> I, don't, um, no, right. I didn't yeah. set that time. Yeah. But you made this agenda. Natalie, do you have any um, That's true. any updates or comments? Policy. Guilty. No. Okay. I don't think there's anything new. Okay. I would just like to acknowledge that we had our credit for life fair last week, of which oh, yeah. some of you participated in. I'm sure Natalie did. Um, I wasn't able to attend, but I heard it was another fantastic event. So thank you yes. to everyone who volunteered and to the high school for putting it on. Um, my high school senior said it was in valuable um, and that she rocked it so that was cool um, so I, that means she's not living at home and she's yeah got a she even had a stipend for traveling every weekend which I found amazing <laughs> she did not have pay my mother back for everything she's ever given to me her whole life but you know we'll work on that um, and also just to acknowledge that the run for Robin was on Sunday it was a beautiful community event I think most everyone participated and it honors our good friend Robin Harvey and the good work that her family Family continues to do in her name so that was really wonderful um, and one thing for the um, on the horizon yep. if we could um, maybe ask the safety and security committee at some point doesn't have to be anytime soon for just an update of the work that they do I know we get a lot of that facilities update from Diane but I think having a committee um, report out on what some of the findings are unfortunately I think there have been a lot of um, terrible events in, in our country that have made people start to feel a bit insecure and I think as best we can to assure the community that we have plans in place um, for taking care of our students and our staff in case of the unfortunate event of an emergency is, is important for us to do. So I would ask that. Other than that, may I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Thank you very much everybody. All right. I'll take blame for the agenda.